Now, Rick, we're we're joining together uh, with your wonderful podcast, and why don't you explain um, what it is you've been doing, and then introduce our illustrious speaker we have tonight. Um, yeah, I'm just started a Zoom community to uh, called Inspiring Artists, just to kind of give back to, uh, I guess, mainly writers, but also uh, anyone else in the industry that's you know looking to connect and. Uh, with working writers and working professionals um, just to yeah to make it a little bit easier to navigate and also to make friends that's basically it so um, so we got David Morrell today um, and then in two weeks I have uh, um, uh, what was his name uh, well that's okay tell us about David yeah. All right. make it good thanks <laughs> Uh, so, David Morrell today, uh, who's joining us, is a New York Times bestseller of over 30 novels and the author of First Blood, the novel in which Dan Rambo was created. He has a PhD in American literature from Penn State and was a professor in the English department at the University of Iowa for many years. In addition to First Blood, he also had his classic espionage novel, The Brotherhood of the Rose, which I own. Excellent. Uh, turned into a miniseries, uh, the only one to ever be broadcast after a Super Bowl. His latest novels are the Victorian mystery thrillers, Murder as a Fine Art, Inspector of the Dead, and Ruler of the Night. And anyone looking to expand into novel writing, his writing book, The Successful Novelist, describes what he has learned in his five decade career, which is available through Amazon and other retailers, which um, I highly recommend. So thanks for joining us, David. We really appreciate you uh, coming on. Yeah, it's thank a, you. It's a bit of a shock to hear somebody refer to a five decade career, but it is uh, it, a half century. It's hard for me to believe that I've been uh, a published writer that long. Yeah, and, uh, and I own 20 of those novels. <laughs> God um, bless you. Yeah, and uh, I just finished for the first time, I just finished the first Blood novel, um, which we'll be talking about in depth because um, most of the people that had questions uh, obviously referred to that no to that novel. Um, so, um, you know, Rambo had to do uh, with a Vietnam vet with PTSD and uh, VME being a military organization, do you have any connections to the military through your parents or siblings, grandparents? Well, but my defining moment uh, involves my father. I'm, I'm from Canada originally. I'm an American citizen now, but I was raised in Canada. And my father was a British aviator during World War II. Oh, yeah. uh, he came to Canada to train Canadian flyers to enter the war. So it, near as I can tell, he, he, this is in Southern Ontario. He arrived in late sometime in 42 we met my mother got married I was born in 43 and then he was recalled uh, and he was um, it, it, it's a at the time would have been a harrowing uh, a, a, a harrowing uh, part of the military he was in the Navy but he was a flyer yeah and his uh, profession was as a forward observer which meant that his aircraft, there would have been more than one in the aircraft, flew over positions that were being bombarded by Navy ships on D-Day. And uh, he was shot down, the aircraft was shot down on the second day of D-Day. And uh, my mother, um, it's funny how, you know, certain things as we're young stick with us, but I was raised to believe that my father had died in combat, yeah. that he had died when he was shot down. Um, and I had this uh, fantasy that it had not happened and that one day he would walk in the door. So when I was perhaps 23 years old, my mother one day speaking casually said, oh, that reminds me of something that George wrote to me after he was shot down. Mm. And so naturally I, I became quite alert. And what she told me then was that 
he had been found by the French underground. He had been, I have no idea how, gotten out of France, uh, gotten to England in a military hospital where he died, mm. as my mother said, and there's no, all of this is, you know, in the family. My mother said that there wasn't a ready amount of antibiotics to treat whatever it was that was wrong with him. So I grew up haunted by a father I didn't know anything about, and then I found out had lived but died. So it was all very, um, it was all very traumatic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so in a way, I I'm hardwired to, to think about the military. And it's interesting to me that um, many years later, I became a private pilot. Uh, and it, only, it was only later that I understood that in some weird way, subconsciously, I was perhaps connecting mm -hmm. with a father I never knew. And this, is a, this theme is just all through my fiction. Uh, and one of the things I encourage people to do is you know, pay attention to those subconscious things that are jabbing at them because that's really the interesting things they have to write about. Yeah, yeah, mine uh, seems to be my daughter. <laughs> you know, just the relationship that her and I have seems to wiggle its way into everything I've written so far. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I know it's it was a long time ago, but I'm sorry for your loss. Well, I uh, thank you. It certainly was... Um, I never got over it. it being raised as a, a single mother at a time when there was no um, social services to speak of. Yeah. Uh, and um, I was very young and my mother would sometimes take me to other places where there was this man hanging around the family. And I wondered who the heck is that guy? Because I took for granted that families were a single mother and a child. Yeah. Uh, and it was really took me a long time to adjust to the idea of what the conventional uh, notion of the family is. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's a fascinating story, though, as well as is uh, having the French underground get him out and back to England. And there's just so many layers of all the things that were going on during the war. It, exactly. And I wish I knew more, but my mother eventually remarried to somebody who didn't like children. And that's a whole other story about what that, that uh, situation was like. Um, but um, she destroyed everything to do with my birth father. Mm. Uh, I did find, I don't know how they survived. I do have a picture of him in front of an aircraft uh, and a few other pictures of him with her in southern Ontario, but uh, it's all very ghostly. I once wrote a novel about photography, about a, a thriller about a photographer, and I did it because I've always associated photographs with death. Yeah. And that photographs freeze time. And when we look at a photo, we always say, oh, look at what it was like then. You know, how young somebody was, or the tree, look at how small it was then, or look at that house where we used to live, or that apartment, or what have you. And that sense of time haunts photographs um, as I guess something maybe that I, I um, picked up from these ghostly photographs that somehow my mother didn't destroy. I have no idea why she didn't. Yeah. Um, I have no, I don't know anything about my birth father's relatives. Uh, you know, that's a whole mystery over there. My mother said vaguely, oh, they were all killed in the Blitz, which was, um, I'm assuming with the military uh, uh, audience here, they, that you're aware, people are aware that that was when the Germans bombed major portions of, of England during the war. And, and, you know, I don't know if they lived in London or wherever, or if she was lying to me. I grew up in a lot of lies, yeah. uh, which is maybe a good thing for a, a, a writer, a novelist to, to have. Yeah. How did you get your start in writing? Did you always do it as a child or did you, it was something you thought you wanted to do later? No, I, I, I think I was hardwired. Um, and, and since this is a writer's group, 
with also military connections. Um, I, whenever I teach at conferences, I always start with a quote from Graham Greene, an unhappy childhood is a gold mine for a writer. Uh, and everything I've ever written about comes out of the traumas and confusion I had when I was very young. Yeah. Um, my mother could not support me and earn a living. She was a master seamstress. She could handle a sewing machine like concert geniuses play the piano. It was a wonderful to see her. Yeah. But she couldn't do that and watch me. So she was forced to put me in an orphanage. Now I was in an orphanage, I think it was for a year. She said it was long or shorter, but <laughs> it was, for me, it was very long. And, um, you know, one of the hardest things for a writer is to sit by yourself and be alone. I was hardwired to do that. Mm. I mean, I'm an only child and I, I was, I called it, I called it doing time in the orphanage. Yeah. And then my father or my mother remarried. The stepfather did not like children and they fought. And this is where the storytelling comes in. Um, I had never seen a prison movie. Um, but you know how in these movies, when they're about to break out, they stuff pillows and things under the blankets. Yeah. Well, my father, my stepfather and my mother argued a lot. And I grew up in a state of fear. So when I was four years, five years, six years old, I fixed the bed and put the pillow there. And then I, because I was afraid. So I crawled under the bed and that's where I slept. And when I was under the bed, I told stories to myself. And the stories I told, I was not a victim. I was the hero rescuing other people. And I often, I, I tell, I'm old enough to have grandchildren, I tell them life is binary and some of the choices you have are you can be the victim of your life story or you can be the hero of your life story. And I was determined to, I mean, I knew this wasn't right, so I was going to get out of it somehow. So I, I told stories to myself and I always wanted to tell stories as a consequence. Um, and so it started when I was very young. Did you start writing them down at that time? Or no, did you just... I, I did not. Um, I was very confused to the point that uh, the principal of my high school said that he actually called me into his office and I remember him looking at me and saying, you'll never amount to anything. Hmm. And the reason he was saying that is he had heard that I was watching television from when I went home at night until in those days, in the Stone Age, television went off at 12 o'clock, it stopped, or one o'clock in some regions, and the national anthem played, and then there was a test pattern. Then I stayed up, that's how much I wanted to escape. Uh, I stayed up and watched television until it went off the air, except I wouldn't watch the news because I was convinced that in the middle of the broadcast, someone would come on and say, war has just been declared. And that was a that was a trauma for me. I couldn't I could not watch television news until maybe the end of grade school, yeah. uh, because I associated it with the death of my father, whom I never knew, but I desperately wished for. So it was all very complicated, and and uh, um, what saved my life really was a television show uh, called Route sixty six. Um, that again, I'm, 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 I'm older than I look. This was in 1960 and I was 17. Um, and this show was about two young men in a Corvette convertible driving across the United States. Remember, I'm in Canada watching this yeah. in search of America and in search of themselves. And the show was filmed on location wherever those young men drove. It wasn't a reality show, there were scripts. Yeah. There were stories which had an amazing amount of action and ideas combined. And over time, I learned that the same man wrote almost every script. His name was is very distinctive, Sterling Siliphant. Hmm. And I, um, and those of you who are screenwriters, if you're not aware of Sterling's legacy, you should be, because at one time he was 
the highest paid screenwriter in the 70s. He, no one made more money than he did. And uh, he had an Oscar for In the Heat of the Night. He wrote, he was the king of, he, he laughed about this. He was the king of disaster movies. Mm -hmm. He wrote The Poseidon Adventure. He wrote The Towering Inferno. And then God help me, it wrote The Swarm. And as he said, who do I have to blank, blank, blank to get off this picture? Um, and I, I was so enamored of these scripts. The power of writing is really the theme here. Yeah. That I, at the age of 17, I could not type. I wrote a hand letter. And at the end of every episode, it said, this has been a Screen Gems production. So I'm thinking, all right, Route 66 Screen Gems, there's something here. And I went to my local library. And to this day, librarians are some of my favorite people. So I went to the librarian and I said, how do I get in touch with Screen Gems? <laughs> and I didn't believe it was possible. And uh, she, she just grinned at me and went away and came back with the address. I sent the letter to Sterling and Sterling wrote back within a week. Mm. A two, two page single spaced letter. That's amazing. But it, it is. And, and, and what it came down to, it was very long. He said, dear Mr. Morell, and he knew I was only 17. Mm. He said, dear Mr. Morell, I'm so sorry I took so long to respond to your letter. But I was out at sea in, on a boat at the time your letter arrived. And where we get down to the bottom of it, and he says, I can't read your material for obvious reasons, God help him, you know, I'm 17. Yeah. But he said, this is how it's done. If you're meant to be a writer, you write and 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 write. And, write. and then you find other people who are interested in writing, which is one reason why I agree to, to do, do conversations like this, because I'm passing on what Sterling did for me. Yeah. And he said, you will meet other people who are interested in writing and you, you will learn from them or at least get enthusiasm from being with them. And then you'll write and write and write and write. And one day, if you have something to say, someone of influence will find you and help you. And he said, it is that terribly simple and that terribly difficult. Was that your and mentor, so, Philip Kloss? Pardon me? Was that your mentor, uh, Philip Kloss? No, that was, that was Sterling Siliphant, but then I later I'm found right, yeah. someone else. But, but, but um, so I set off on my voyage um, and, you know, to leap far ahead, Sterling and I eventually became very close, almost. Oh, the secret to my life is the father-son dynamic. And um, Sterling became like a father to me. And when you mentioned Brotherhood of the Rose, when it was the only miniseries was NBC after a Super Bowl, 33 million people watched that. And uh, Sterling Siliphant was the executive producer. Yeah. So he and I not only became fast friends, uh, but we also got to work together. And so, you know, the, cl the closing of that world was yeah. really meaningful to me. Um, so I set out to, I, to, I wanted, I told him, I want to be you, uh, which isn't to say I wanted to imitate him because nobody is a success if you're imitating. Um, but his approach to life, he was a traveling salesman and, um, he was always moving forward as a consequence. And when route 66 was on the air, he stayed in a car five weeks ahead of the production as if he were one of the characters. And he came into a town, met with the CBS affiliate. It was a CBS show. They, they showed him the town. And then he went to a motel and wrote a script in three days <laughs> and then sent it on. And he did this for four years while he, he was also writing for other television shows, including Naked City. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never been a career like it. And we, today we have, uh, and I don't mean to knock and I won't name anybody. Uh, uh, there are people who are well known for having done a lot of shows, written them. <clears throat> but 
many of them have a writer's room. Yeah. Uh, Sterling did not have a writer's room. Sterling was a guy in a room writing. And when he, at the end of his career, the Writers Guild had to redo the, the primitive computers at the time, but had to redo its entire system for retirees because nobody had ever made that much money as a writer in the Writers Guild. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, he was really cool. I, I, and, you know, I learned from him, you got to keep moving forward. You got to change and, you know, just keep testing. And it, it's, that's what Route 66 did for me. And it's available on DVD. Uh, so if anybody ever wants to look at it, it's there. Oh, great. That's a good plug for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So did when you went to Penn State, did you know you wanted to be a novelist or were you thinking screenwriting? When I, my, my goal would have been to work in movies and television. Okay. To be Sterling. And Sterling had a show that, um, that was maybe coming up and he, we exchanged a lot of letters as I progressed and I kept writing to him and he would answer. Um, and and there, there was a possibility that a series, I think it was called, now I won't be able to remember it, Mayday. It was a military thing. I think it was gonna be about the Coast Guard and emergencies in the Coast Guard. And he told me, and, and, and we occasionally I'd phone him, and uh, he would. He said to me, "If if this series go, I'll hire you as a, you know, very low, uh, you know, but that'll be a way for you to, you know, move up and try to learn." But the series didn't go, mm. and by then, I'm, I mean, I'm in Canada uh, at a small college, so what, how am I going to, you know, how do you, how do you get into that industry? And so I gradually understood that if I was ever going to get into the movie world, that I would have to do it through fiction. And then, so as a consequence, I, you know, everybody was shocked because I went to college and I got a BA. And then because I realized how hard it was to earn a living as a writer, I then decided to go into grad school and that's how I wound up at Penn State and I got a master's and a doctorate there. And by then I was, you know, I was in the book world. So, you know, that fork in the road had, you know, I'd taken that road for that I was in, in the book world. Yeah. How many novels did you write before you got to First Blood? Or was that your first? That was it. Wow. And how did yeah. that come about that it was then optioned as a film? Well, there's, there, there, that's an adventure in itself. Um, but I, I Lest we not mention him, at Penn State, um, there was a professional writer named, his, his, his real name was Philip Class, but his pen name was William Ten. Mm -hmm. He was a science fiction writer who had been a big deal in the 50s during the golden age of that genre. And Penn State had done this really weird thing. They had hired a professional writer to teach writing. I mean, that almost never happens. I mean, how wild is that? And um, he and I, I approached him and I said, you know, I don't know how to do this. I need help, but I, and, and I, something about me must have, must have uh, spoken to him. And he actually gave me a test. He said, give me a short story a week. And I was going to grad school. I mean, I'm taking classes, I'm married. I have a very young child and you know, I got to earn a living. I got to get out of here and teach or do something. And uh, he, he said, write me a short story a week. Well, the thing about work is, you know, if it's only work, here we go. Uh, so I wrote a short story a week and uh, he never, he didn't, if he read them, he didn't tell me. I just, every Friday or whenever I turn in this short story. And finally he called me into his office and he, I, you know, obviously it was a test. It, would I, would I, you know, get with the regiment? Finally, he looked at me and he said, please stop, you're terrible. And I was, because I was writing bad James Joyce. Because I was in the university environment 
and I was, um, I'd forgotten Route 66. I'd forgotten Sterling. Um, and uh, he introduced me to a um, British thriller writer named Jeffrey Household. It's the British spelling, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. And the household had written a book called Rogue, R-O-G-U-E, Male, M-A-L-E, about a British big game hunter who stalks Hitler on the eve of the Second World War. The book was published in 39, a very, you know, and the, 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 the wonderful thing about the book, it's a great idea, the big game hunter gets caught on the first page. And the story is about what happens after that and what the Nazis do to him. And oh, it's just a wonderful book. And I went back to uh, Philip Class, William Ten, and I said, you mean you're allowed to write this way? And that was it. And maybe in two months, I was writing First Blood. Wow. And uh, it, it took me three years uh, from 68, 69, 70 into 71 because um, I was getting my degrees and then I was teaching. Uh, but I worked on that sucker for three years in many drafts, all often thinking I would never be able to finish it because it went in so many different directions. I was teaching myself how to write a novel. And, and um, Philip Class had an agent and the agent came to Penn State because Philip, class had bought a house this first house he'd ever owned and so the agent uh henry morrison and a friend uh a client of henry's and a and a friend of philip class named donald e westlake uh, whom some of you all may recognize as one of the greatest crime writers ever uh who under the name of richard stark also wrote a series of hard-boiled novels about a thief named Parker um, and a lot of movies were made out of his stuff and Philip Class said to me uh, here's my agent here's one of my good friends one of the best writers in the business go over there on the staircase and tell him about First Blood he didn't tell me he was going to do this and so for the first time in my life I pitched to somebody and, and it was on a staircase at a housewarming where people were going up and there was only one toilet and it was upstairs. So people were going up and down past us as I'm trying to tell this story to this agent and this great writer. And I finished and I remember the agent looking at, at Don Westlake and saying, what do you think? And Westlake said, I think it's a hell of a story. And, and Don and, and Henry Morrison said, I do too. When you finish, send it to me. And so all of a sudden I had an agent. Hmm. And so in a way, I was blessed. You know, all the steps were there for me um, to proceed. But as we all know, you know, you can try and try and try. That doesn't mean it's going to be good for you. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work there and also a lot of luck. Yeah. And yeah. as you're discovering, I talk a lot. I don't take short, you know, do short you know, so bear with me as I. Oh, as I love I, it. You know, I love the stories. You get to so many, uh, so many little tidbits. You know that would be impossible to ask the question to get to. Yeah. So I love it. I give um, you a that, sound bite. Not the same. That does. That does. We had some questions that people submitted beforehand, and one person sure. was asking Joel Sear, uh, Searles actually was asking. Um, who were your influences for the Rambo character? And uh, he also wonders that, you know, about the sheriff and, and the colonel, but um, how did you first come up with the idea for Rambo and, and where did those characters come from? Well, we have to, there are a couple of things. One is, um, it's a surprise to some people, a Canadian created Rambo. I didn't become an American citizen until 1993. It's very hard to become a citizen, by the way. Um, you know, there's a whole debate about why don't they just become citizens? It's hard. Uh, and um, so it wasn't until I moved to New Mexico that I found the mechanism where I was able to become a citizen. But I was first in the United States as a 
foreign student and my wife and my, our very, very, very little daughter were allowed in with me. And at the border um, at Windsor, um, the immigration official quite rightly said, you are a guest in this country. And um, as you are a guest in a home, you have to behave that way. And so you might have political opinions that you come upon as you go through your stay in this country, keep them to yourself. And I took that to heart. Um, so, in 1968, in, in years ago in England and in Europe, in 1848, there was something called the Year of Revolution, in which almost every nation in Europe came close to toppling and did topple in terms of their royal houses because of the revolutions that occurred. In 1968, in the United States, I felt that was going to happen. That was the year that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. That was the year that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. That was the year of the riot at the Democratic Convention um, in which police and protesters were for three nights in what amounted to combat outside that convention. That was the year that there were not 10 riots in the United States or 20 or 50 or 100. There were several hundred riots in the United States. Violent, violent riots of the sort that we saw on January 6th, often citywide. Uh, well, that's wrong. It wasn't citywide, but often the inner cities. And to this day, some cities have never recovered. Inner Detroit, inner Gary, Indiana, inner, inner LA, never recovered. Um, and it seemed like every week there was a riot. In fact, there were more than one every week. There were like four every week. It's hard to imagine. Um, and I became convinced that the United States was going to topple, that there was going to be a civil war, that the distress that was happening in the civil rights movement and in the anti-war pro faction, that you put all that together and I didn't see how the Republic could stand, that we were heading toward chaos. And I decided, and I had um, a moment of one of, you know, it, 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 when writers have that one moment when they say, yes, I want to write that. And for me, it was an evening. It was at 530. I think it would have been about then. Walter Cronkite was then the, the uh, news presenter on CBS Evening News. And they did two stories back to back. They did a firefight in Vietnam. And they did a riot in the United States. And I had this moment where I thought, if you turn down the volume, it's the same story. And this moment came to me, what would happen if a highly skilled operator, operative operator, I'm getting the word mixed up, highly skilled special operations person from coming back from Vietnam, who was disaffected now. He hated what had happened to him there because he had learned that he was good at killing people. And he was going to set out to go walk across the United States to see what he'd been fighting for. And that was the start of the, of the, of the, of the novel. And I said, well, I need an antagonist. So in a way, Rambo is quite different in a way from the, from the movies, especially the second and third ones. Uh, Rambo was like the characters in Route 66 on a quest to find something, to find America and find himself. And he grew his hair long, he grew a beard, and he was for all 
anybody could tell a hippie. The first sentence of the novel says his name was Rambo and he was just some nothing kid for all anybody knew, standing by the pump of a gas station on the outskirts of Madison, Kentucky. He had a he had long hair, he had a beard and a sleeping bag rolled over his shoulder. And naturally the police stop him. Because in 1968, when I started that novel, if you had long hair and a beard, you got stopped. Mm -hmm. And I grew my mustache at that time. You can see how daring I was. <laughs> Wasn't prepared to grow the beard. I grew this mustache in 68 just to see, and I'm telling you, it made a difference. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of hostility. So I needed another character and that had to be a policeman, a police chief. And he was of another generation. He's old enough to be Rambo's father, unlike the movie where they're, old, they're brothers as it were. But in the, in the novel, Teasel is old enough to be Rambo's father. And he was a hero, I hate to use those words, uh, in, in the military context. He distinguished himself in the chosen reservoir retreat in Korea. And he is, as it were, an Eisenhower Republican who understands conventional war. And when he comes into contact with Rambo, he hasn't the faintest idea what guerrilla warfare is like. And he figures that if you have a lot of guys going after one guy, it's no problem. He, he just doesn't grasp it. And the whole point of the story then was to be that when Rambo, and in the novel, he destroys the posse, it's far more than in the movie, that the police chief would say, I get it, I get it, Rambo, he's a better fighter, but I'm a better organizer. And that's when he sends for the guy that trained Rambo. And, and then, so now you have a threesome as it were, and you have an allegory. You have Rambo right on one side of the political spectrum, Teasel on the other, and, and Troutman representing the system, and Troutman's first name is Sam. He's Uncle Sam. And, you know, I mean, you can go through the book and just, you know, do it as a, you know, can diagram it in terms of the, the thematic implications. And the whole idea was that the viewpoints would alternate Rambo, Teasel, Rambo, Teasel. When we saw Teasel from Rambo's point of view, we'd say, you know, what a horrid guy. When we saw Rambo, when we, I'm getting it mixed up now, Teasel, you get it. When you see them back and forth, we become sympathetic with the viewpoint character and hate the other guy. But then when we switch viewpoints, we like this guy and we hate that guy. So the whole idea was that there are no winners. And that, you know, that what was happening in the United States for, for everybody thought they were right. You know, nobody sets out to do something that they're doing it for the wrong reasons. Uh, but from somebody else's point of view, they're wrong. And so that was the logic of the novel, that, that they would all go together. Uh, I'm sorry that they would, they would be so opposite, but that the end and the climax, they would head on, head on like two trains and, and the reader wouldn't know who to cheer for. So getting First Blood made took over 10 years, several directors, yes. several actors. How did it find, how did it, first of all, how did it get noticed by Hollywood? And what was the journey well, finally getting it made 10 years so later? Many, many writers uh, uh, listening here, watching have agents. And for those who, who, who don't understand the system, um, writers need agents to represent them, uh, if for no other reason than if they try to represent themselves, they have a fool for a client. Um, you know, you need somebody who's objective who can look and say, you know, you can maybe make these adjustments in your work, it might be better, and they have contacts the writer does not have in order to sell the material. So my agent, um, and remember, Donald at Westlake was one of his clients and sold many, many books and movies. And so the initial purchase, well, it wasn't a purchase, it was an option, was by somebody named Stanley Kramer, who in the day was really important. He was known for idea pictures. 
Um, and uh, I mean, he was an Oscar winner, moreover, uh, many times and a big, big deal. And he agreed to purchase, to option the book. An option is where they give you a certain amount of money and they have the right for a year or two years to develop it to get a script made in order to try to get the picture made. But if the picture hasn't been made at the end of the option period, the writer and I get to keep the money and I retain, I regain rights to the project. And uh, he agreed to option the property and he never delivered a, a contract. And there were ads in the New York Times, Stanley Kramer options first blood never sent a contract and finally said that he didn't have the money. Hmm. And so we had lost six months. And what happened was that a man named Lawrence Terman, who was one of the producers of The Graduate, uh, found the book. This is so odd how these things happen. Found the book in a bookstore in Beverly Hills and looked at it and read it and thought that this would be, it, it had so much action. There, there are few, I, forgive me for saying this, but it was my, my purpose. I wanted to see how much action, believable, well-written action I could put into a novel. Um, and as my agent was concerned, it'd never get published because there'd never been anything with that amount of action in it. Uh, so naturally, when it got over that hurdle, Larry Terman thought this could be a movie. And he went to a producer, writer, director, whom I deeply admire, uh, named Richard Brooks. And Brooks had done Elmer Gantry, multiple Oscar winner, Elmer Gantry in Cold Blood. Um, a couple of Westerns I really love, The Professionals and uh, Bite the Bullet. And uh, Brooks was hired by Columbia, who purchased the book outright not didn't option so now if whatever happened i did i would never get the property back i had the money and they had the book but did they insist and, on uh, that or was that what your agent uh, they, they wanted they didn't want to they wanted the book okay. um sometimes it happens that way i had mm -hmm. a, a book uh, called extreme denial that michael douglas bought for a very large amount um outright and did nothing with it to this day and uh, the fact it's so tangled, nobody even knows who owns the film rights anymore. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they skipped over the option process and bought it outright. And uh, Richard Brooks worked on it for a year. And for reasons nobody knows, Columbia Pictures decided to sell the, the property to Warner Brothers. At that time, it was rumored that Paul Newman would play the police chief because as I said, nobody knew who the hero was. So you could do it. So the police chief was the hero and a lot of it then would depend on your politics. You know, depending on how you view First Blood, you, your, your politics is sort of revealed. Um, and um, I heard that whether or not it is true, I do not know, but I know for certain that Steve McQueen signed to be Rambo and that Sidney Pollock, one of my very favorite directors, was signed to direct. And I know this because Sidney told me it himself. But the picture would have been made in 1975. And there were no, Steve McQueen was then in his mid 40s and there were no, mid 40 year old Vietnam veterans in 1975. You know, these days with Iraq, uh, I was with the US O tour to Iraq in 2010. And um, I met grandmothers and grandfathers over there who were serving young, but you know, 55, but they had the weapons and you know, they had the, the, the they were in a position of responsibility. There was nothing like that from Vietnam, that was an 18 year old war. And so they realized that it would be ludicrous for Steve, even though he wanted to do the motorcycle thing, it would be ludicrous for him to be in the movie. So it, they just all walked away. 
And then it went through another studio and another studio. And then finally a company called Carolco who had been film distributors in the Orient and wanted to make American movies, um, found the project, bought it from Warner Brothers uh, and took the script that one of 26 that had been prepared and said, uh, this is the one we wanna make. And then they went to Sylvester uh, to see if he wanted to be in it. Now that's a tangled, tangled story. Yeah, probably good for your sanity that you had just outright <laughs> sold the rights to the book so you didn't have to keep track well, of every iteration with well, like I, renewed hope. <laughs> well, it would have been better for me uh, because if it was an option, every time one of those studios, I would have made more money in the long run. Uh, right. Options are the way to go. Often I, I have one book, I, I think I've optioned it 10 times. And I, you know, I think this is great. Do I ever want them to make it? It probably wouldn't be very good. So I just keep taking the money every two years. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, so it was out of my hands. Uh, I thought, well, this is interesting. I have no control over this. And, uh, you know, just watching it unfold. The good news for me was that I was 29 years old when First Blood was published. And if at the age of 29, the hoopla that occurred with Rambo in the 80s had happened, I probably would have been insufferable. I probably would have been the biggest dodo anybody ever saw. Um, but I had 10 years to be seasoned. I had 10 years to teach. I had 10 years to learn about the business. I had other books that were published. And when the movie came out in 82, I can tell you it was more a matter of interest to me rather than, oh, I'm hot shot. Yeah. And you know, I, 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 I take those 10 years as uh, having saved my personality. I think I would have been just horrible. Uh, and I've seen it happen to other people when they have instant success and there's, you know, oh boy, God loves me. Uh, well, no. <laughs> what are there some things uh, that particularly strike you about the movie that you would still love to change? Like watching it now, well, you're like, oh, I would change this one thing or these 10 things. Uh, there's only one thing I would change and I would take out, there are too many expletives in it. Um, the, there's an awful lot of foul language, which isn't necessary, and I don't know why it's in there. I had a good relationship with the producers, and this is anybody who's a novelist out there, or even, you know, you screenwriters, you know the producers, the enemy, right? I mean, this is, you know, they're, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll swindle you in any way they possibly can. And, um, and that's a good thing to be aware of, too. You know, that they may treat you as the greatest thing in the world, but the fact is they're schemers. Um, uh, but uh, I had a good relationship with these two producers, Andrew Vanya and Mario Costar. And Andy, when, as an example, the, the novel takes place in Kentucky, in the mountains in Kentucky. And they moved, it's, it's so interesting that this American icon was filmed in British Columbia, again, the Canadian connection. And they decided for monetary reasons to film in Canada, partly because the, the Canadian dollar was worth about 86 cents against the American dollar. So the American dollar would go far, you know, much farther in Canada, plus British Columbia and Canada had incentives for people who would film there. Later on, Vancouver would become, a, you know, a, a, like the second Hollywood, but uh, at the time it, that was not the case. So there were good reasons for them to film in uh, British Columbia, not to mention it looks great. And, uh, but Andy phoned me one day. I mean, imagine a producer phoning an author. This is like insane. I mean, what craziness is this that a producer would actually phone the author of the book that they purchased the, the thing from? You can see it, the, <laughs> my attitude and all this. And he said, we're thinking of translating the setting from Kentucky to the Pacific Northwest. Is there a reason we should not do it? Is there a is there a reason the story will not work if we move it there? And I said, there's no reason whatsoever. And he said, thank you. 
and you know and but how smart he was you know go to the source and find out if there's going to be trouble and few producers would ever do that um uh so um anyway um if anybody wants my detailed thoughts on this again this is so weird um i recorded a full-length audio commentary for first blood can you imagine they went to the author and to ask him to comment on a movie based upon his novel i mean what how crazy is that and so if you want my detailed uh, notions about book versus movie uh, that's the way to go but the simple answer is i think it's a terrific film it's not my novel it interprets rambo differently my guy is angry but in the film he's a victim uh, and and that's one reason why they couldn't make the movie for 10 years because the hostility in the character and they were trying to keep him soft and soft and the body count in the novel is like one critic said the novel is war as hell and the film is war as heck um, because it's so, so tamed down compared to what happens in the novel where a real local war occurs. Um, but that's okay because movies are different from books and what works in a book might not end a film and vice versa. And the decisions that were made were the right ones. Um, uh, the, it, it, the big change is in the ending and uh, um, Rambo dies at the end of the novel. The man who trained him kills him. The system wins. Um, and that, a version of that was filmed, only Troutman didn't kill Rambo. Rambo committed suicide. And that version of the film was shown to test audiences, and they did not like that ending. Uh, they, they, they were really furious. And so Andy and Mario decided to go back to British Columbia and shoot a new ending in which he walks out of the police station. And this was amazing to them because they saw the film as a one-off. Rambo's dead. And now they saved him and it was a tremendous financial success. And they, I remember Andy telling me, he said, we had no notion of doing sequels. But the test audiences told them us to keep the, the uh, character alive and we did. And by God, we got to do all those sequels. So again, you know, it's so funny how, how all this can happen. So the only thing I would change, you know, understanding the book, the film is what it is and my book is what it is. And, you know, for consistency, I, I've all, I've, I feel this too much, too many expletives. And I'm not that kind of person that I object to follow language. I just felt, enough we got it we don't need any more and that would be the one thing that i would change what kind of di research did you do for that for that novel specifically well uh we remember i at the time was canadian yeah so i've not been in the american military i've not been in the canadian military um when i got the idea for the novel I knew I had to do a lot of research. Uh, I had to learn about weapons. And uh, I went to the NRA uh, who taught me the weaponry. Um, and in those days, it, it isn't, the NRA then was, was a more innocent version. There, it, it was about teaching people safe handling of firearms and not um, you know, amendment rights and things like that. Um, and I had, uh, I was teaching, I, 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 I was able to afford to go to Penn State in the graduate program because they gave me a stipend if I taught writing. Mm -hmm. Now, why they knew I would be able to type writing, I have no idea. But so I taught first year what they called rhetoric but it's just how to write essays. And in 68, there were some students in my class who were hostile. 
uh, uh, young men and they lingered after class and it turned out they were newly returned from Vietnam. And they were, we'll just put it politely, confused <laughs> about how somebody their age was up there telling them how to do things when I should have been in Vietnam doing what they had done. So I then explained to them, I'm a Canadian, I'm married, I have a child. There is no way I could go down and volunteer and they wouldn't take me. It wasn't going to happen. So the tone of the conversation uh, got milder. And after class, they began to tell me what it was like coming back and what it was like for them over there. And it was there that I learned there was no PTSD um, phrase in those days. That came early 80s. Um, but they had the symptoms. They told me about the nightmares and difficulty sleeping, difficult in relationships, uh, uh, too much alcohol, uh, 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 diving for cover when there was a loud noise and, and on and on and on. And uh, Rambo in a way became an amalgam of the things they told me in these conversations after class. And then I remembered Audie Murphy. And Audie Murphy in World War II was America's most decorated soldier. Uh, Medal of Honor and a lot of other citations. And he had written a book called To Hell and Back about his experiences in World War II. And he was this short Texan with a baby face. You know, I, how old was he, 17? Or I, I mean, I, I'd have to go and look, but he was pretty young. I mean, I think he lied about his age to, to get into the military. And I'm, um, but I knew the story because Audie Murphy came back and became a movie actor. He, became a Western star um, and made a couple of important films, The Undefeated um, with uh, Burt Lancaster uh, movie with uh, Audrey, uh, Gene Simmons um, and um, Red Badge of Courage, uh, uh, ideal for him of the Civil War, but a young man in the Civil War directed by John Huston. And he made a lot of, of modestly budgeted films for uh, Universal but he suffered from PTSD and he had nightmares. He had a pistol under his bed. He woke up often shooting. When he was on location, they used to, if he was in a motel somewhere, you know, in, in, in a rural location, he'd be shooting the walls and they'd move the, the frames, the picture frames around to hide the bullet holes um, so that they could get the, 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 the film finished before the manager started wondering what the hell was happening to his hotel room. Uh, he was a very troubled man. Uh, at one point he was uh, on trial for attempted murder um, because he had a friend of his had had a dog trained and Murphy didn't think that the trainer had done a proper job and moreover had not had charged too much. And an argument ensued and Murphy who carried a firearm hit him over the head with a weapon. And uh, he was, I suspect because of his uh, distinguished status as a veteran, he, he was not, uh, he did not serve any time for that. And one of my favorite stories about Murphy uh, is that uh, two stories, uh, some, and I, uh, you know, how to say this and not sound, because today, you know, our relationship with, with Germany is quite different. Um, but in the day, uh, some, uh, for some reason, some, some German journalists came to the set to interview him. And somebody noted that they all looked terrified. And he said, yeah, I probably shot a lot of their brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, on a set, um, a, a, a assistant director had made his female co-star cry. And he went over to the assistant director and said to him, you make her cry again and I'll kill you. 
And the assistant director said, when Audie Murphy said that to you, you believed it. And if you look at the action scenes in his Westerns, he goes into some very, very troubled places during the action scenes. And so I said, Rambo is Audie Murphy. He's as if he were in Vietnam instead of World War II. And he's going to grow a beard. And he's going to grow long hair. And he's going to get arrested. And they're going to, as happened, because the event with the shaving, uh, in the movie, it's not the case, but they're going to cut his hair. And they are going to shave him, actually. Uh, but in the, the, the event, it came out of a real event in the American Southwest where a group of hippies were detained for vagrancy and were forcibly shaved and uh, both their hair and their beards and then rousted out of town. And I mean, that's the way the world was then. And I thought, all right, what would happen if Audie Murphy came back? He grew a long hair, he grew a beard and they decided to arrest him and they're gonna shave his beard and his hair. What's Audie gonna do? And that was always in my mind when I was writing the book that that Audie and that Audie was Rambo. That's fascinating. And you had so many people around you who had such excellent pieces for creating this character. We had some questions and, you know, I don't know if it's the same for, for all of your novels this way, or if some of them just come out of nowhere, but, you know, typically characters are built on things that we know, right? But can you describe your process for creating characters and, and coming up with their, their high emotional stakes? Yes. Um... And again, I'm going to speak for novels because if, when you're a screenwriter, you're working for a producer. So you can't always do what I do. In fact, seldom can you. Uh, I have three rules. One is that the idea for a story, for a novel must obsess me. That I must, that I, it's like, I can't not write it. And, and I used an example, I think earlier about photography and, uh, and uh, photographs for me representing death. So I wrote a thriller about a photographer uh, and incorporated all of that as a kind of form of what I called self psychoanalysis for me to understand myself better through the character. And then the research has to be something that is, I don't write about what I know about, I write about what I wanna learn about. So the research has to be something that will make me fuller by the end of the book. And then there has to be something about the way the book is written that has to be different um, and distinct. And people often wonder what I mean. And I, so I'll give an example of First Blood, that the, the, the novel has alternating viewpoints. That is the structure of the book. And I know of no other book that is so strictly adhering to that principle and uses it as a way of saying we all do what we think is right, even though the other person might think we're as wrong as can be. Uh, and so uh, those are the, the, my, my principles. And what I do before I start a project is I write a letter to myself. And I start by, I, and some of it's schizoid. Uh, sometimes I talk to myself, hey, David, how are you today? Oh, I'm okay, how are you? So what are we here for? Uh, well, I have an idea. Well, what's the idea? Uh, well, it's sort of this. And, and, you know, and I try to formulate it as if I'm having a conversation with myself. And these go on for a long time. Um, some of them are 30 pages, single space. And um, I, first of all, uh, you know, what's the idea? And then the other part of me says, so what? And so now I got to answer the so what? And the other part of me is constantly saying, so what? You know, and I'm always on the defensive with this other part of me. And I'm sure if there are any uh, people uh, uh, with uh, um, any psychiatrists, you're, you now know I should be put away. Um, but I find it very useful to bifurcate in that fashion. I saw you do and that. So I, I saw you do that. that? I saw you do that in First Blood. Rambo did yep. that and Kiesel did a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and, and, and I find it very helpful. And, and after I get the idea, so I'm happy with it. Um, then I say, well, what's the best way to represent the idea? 
you know, who, what characters would best represent the point I'm trying to make here. We're not, we're not in philosophy here. We're in, um, we're, we, uh, we're, we have a theme and in, 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 I did a book called Creepers and the whole, whole idea was that eight hours would take place in an abandoned hotel in the dark. And, and that, that was what, what I wanted to do. And, and so I kept saying, okay, how am I gonna do this in the dark? How's it gonna be interesting? Where will it happen? And so, you know, after a while you start asking the questions to do with characterization and time time when's it when when does this occur and where is it occurring and things like that until uh, I'm I feel confident enough that I'm able to start the book and the advantage of this it's writing it's not yakking to your friends and then going into the ozone it's actual writing and you have a document so that if some terrible thing happens to you or to someone you love and you shut down for a long time, you can come back to the document and in like a, a couple hours be up to speed again. So I'm in, in, in my writing book, The Successful Novelist, this is the one um, chapter that everybody talks to me about. It's the one thing that they find to be most helpful. I mean, there are other things, but it's, it's, it's really a winner. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I'm gonna try that for my next project. <laughs> And it's writing, see, you know, because you say, oh, what am I going to write about? And then you go off and, you know, walk the dog or what have you. No, no, you sit down and you start it. And if you do it as a conversation, you know, if you're, if you're script writers, you do it as a conversation. It's amazing how all of this starts to generate uh, some, uh, you know, some tension and some excitement. So how, yeah. how in depth is your outlining process? Do you have an actual outline? I don't do any outlines. Okay. No outlines at all. That's that's it. That letter is my outline. Okay. Yeah. Do you um, do you write anything on sticky notes and stick them around so you have that to go for, or do you just glance back at the letter then as you're in your document? You know your your novel. Uh, you know I don't, but I'm, I'm you know uh, I I have a friend named Melinda Snodgrass who is a writer for Star Trek among other uh, some of the Star Trek series among other things. And, I was, she lives in here in Santa Fe where I live and I, I was invited to a event at her house, a cocktail party. And she said, I wanna show you my office. And I went in and she had this big blackboard and she had all the sticky notes on it. And you know, that's how TV and movies, it, when you have a committee gets written mm -hmm. and see, I'm a loner. So this was like, I'm looking, I said, holy cow, this is fantastic. Because if you're gonna have plot problems, that's where you're gonna find them rather than writing a scene to see where it's gonna take you. So increasingly I have started to think about novels as being like jigsaw puzzles where you have various parts that have to be assembled in a certain way, but you don't always know how they're gonna to come together. And, and this, is, this started me with my Victorian mystery thrillers because those are very complicated plots as Victorian novels must be. Um, and so I, I often write scenes that I knew I needed, but I had the faintest idea where they went and that's not how I normally worked. Mm -hmm. So I found it very frustrating, but then I said, well, am I growing or am I not? You know, am I gonna do the same thing again and again? So increasingly, um, I'm working on, an, on a Western now, a very ambitious Western. And I have uh, 50 pages that I wrote three months ago that I still don't know where they, where they fit. And, you know, I keep saying, I'll get to them yet. And, you know, I, sometimes I say, oh God, I hope I get to them. You know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a long amount of work, but, um, but I don't use the sticky notes, but I'm, I'm kind of doing that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking more about, I have um, um, uh, note, note cards and often I'll write down this scene, this scene, and I'll, I'll put them out this way to see if they make chronological sense. Um, in, in my earlier novels, which were very linear, I didn't need to do that. But as I moved on, the, the plots got more complicated and I had to remember how the heck everything was related to everything else. Did you usually know the ending before you got started? Uh, yeah. Not always. I knew the ending of First Blood and I knew the sentence. 
uh, and and I knew that it was going to end with Troutman having shot uh, Rambo, jacking the empty shotgun shell out of the shotgun, and it would flip through the air, and Teasel dying on the ground would see that shotgun shell flipping, and that would be the end of the book. Um, in some cases, I've known the ending, but not the beginning. In some cases, I've known the beginning. Um, you know, it's all an adventure. Yeah. Um, in a few cases, Creepers, I knew all of it as it came to me. It's one of the rare times when a whole book came to me, bang, like that. Uh, and I was able to write in in three months because it wasn't, you know, the a lot of the challenges weren't there. Yeah, I saw on IMDb that they're trying to make that one. Creepers? Yeah. Yeah. It's been optioned five or six times since 2005. And um, I have in my contracts, because I've learned the hard way that uh, if I sell a property, uh, there's a time limit. And if, if after eight years, the picture hasn't been made, the rights revert to me. Yeah. And, but I have to pay back what I was paid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a free ride, but I get to redo it again. Yeah, and yeah. At one point, one of the producers having optioned it for four times said, what am I doing this for? I'll buy it. And they bought it, but there was a time limit. And eventually it came back to me and the producer then realized what had happened and um, actually uh, entered in negotiations again. Uh, so it's been a very, very uh, uh, complicated thing. Uh, but yes, the answer is I, that has been ready to go in front of the cameras for three years. Um, but for one reason or another, something happened. And then, of course, the pandemic occurred. And, you know, there you go. Well, but it was supposed to get shot last summer. We only I have hope, about, you know. Yeah, yeah. We only have about 15 minutes left with you. So uh, you guys right, who are right, live right now. You know. No, it's great. I just want to say um, there's a little Q&A panel that people can write in yeah, let's their, their questions yeah. now. So if you guys and have any... Be sure. Oh, no, it, this has been this has been amazing. Um, and we had people ask questions ahead of time, too, when they registered. And so some that we've been asking tonight are, are ones for oh, that. Oh, well. great. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Like but I, I just wanted to let them have a little time to write yeah. in their question. I'd like to ask you one question, just because, you know, like you mentioned earlier, life is about growing. Um, becoming yeah. better, not just a better writer, but as a better person. Um, and as you know, when I, like I'm writing, well, me and you were talking about Westerns. So this new one that I'm working on, this character I've written is, is I can't say how, but she's like changed me in ways that I can't really explain. Yeah. So, what book that you've written and what character would you say kind of, who did you grow from the most? Because it's, because when we're writing, they kind of take life for themselves. It doesn't feel like we're writing them. It's like well, sometimes sometimes they're they're a struggle, right? I mean, wow. every book's different. Sometimes they just they arrive, and sometimes, you know, who who dealt this mess? But <laughs> my my granddaughter Natalie died in two thousand and nine of a rare bone cancer. Well, I'm sorry. To hear and that. this is this was especially. I, I can't even find a word. My son, who was 15 years old, died of the same rare bone cancer in 1987. And only 200 people get this disease each year in the United States. Um, it's not inherited. So this is a cosmic, cosmic um, unfairness. Yeah. And I, I was attracted to an, uh, writing a series of books about a man named Thomas De Quincey, a real man in the Victorian era, who was known as the opium eater because he'd written, he was an opium addict at a time when nobody understood that. And um, he had written a, a, a memoir called Confessions of an English Opium Eater, which made him famous. And he did a lot of other things and he invented the word subconscious and he anticipated Freud's theory of psychoanalysis by a half century. And I wanted to write a, a, a thriller about him, a mystery, in which he would take all these sophisticated ideas about the mind and try to explain them to Scotland Yard at a time when they were happy to make plaster casts of footprints. Yeah. 
And it, it just was such a wonderful, wonderful uh, setup. Well, De Quincey had a daughter named Emily and she was 21, he was 69. I mean, she could, would have been his granddaughter really, but she was his daughter. Yeah. And uh, the reason I wanted to write the series of novels was her. Um, that in her relationship with her father, and, and you know, sometimes it's right in front of my face and I don't see it. Um, but I started the book not long after Natalie died. Yeah. And, I, and a bookseller, uh, Barbara Peters, who runs a wonderful story called um, uh, Murder by the, no, I'm sorry, uh, Poison Pen in uh, Scottsdale said, and of course, you were channeling Natalie when you wrote Emily. Yeah. And she said this to me in, on stage in front of a whole lot of people as, and I, you know, I, uh, the bottom dropped out of me because I realized that's what I've been doing, uh, you know, and that I was sort of, as it were, the, the grandfather to, to Natalie and to Quincy to his daughter. And anyway, it's a very powerful thing. And she is the glue for those three books. I mean, without her, those books would be nothing. And every time I got to one of her scenes, I said, oh, boy, I get to write about Emily again. So, you know, it happens. Yeah. So how do you feel like that's changed you as a person? Oh, that's a real hard question. Because, um, you know, I'm trying to be changing all the time. I think what it did is help me adjust to her death. Yeah. Uh, that I had the sense that, uh, in my imagination at least, she was with me still. Uh, and, you know, that's what happens with grief. You, adopt, you, you absorb um, the beloved dead person and make that person one with you and try to go on and lead our lives for them. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's a complicated answer, but uh, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, no, I feel you. But this guy right here is my brother who passed away in 2018. Oh. Um, can't really see him. Yes, and you're, you're new to the emotion. <clears throat> I mean, lost, that emotion. I've lost six people. Me. I've lost six people in four years. I'm about to lose the seventh person, so. And um, uh, someone pointed out to me, you know, if we'd lived in the World War II in in the, in Europe or you know in the Middle Ages, you know, death was so common. Yeah. Everybody died around us. For us, you know, it's it's like an unfamiliar uh, uh, emotion. The grief is. I'm so sorry, and with only two years, um, you know, it took. You know, the theory about grief is that you have the grief and then there's a year and a little scar tissue and then a year and a little more scar tissue. And after a while, you begin remembering them fondly instead of painfully, but it doesn't go away. I mean, in 1987, I think about my son every day yeah. and, you know, 2009, which is very recent, I think about Natalie. But, you know, we, as I said, we live and you might find this helpful. I found it helpful to live my life for other people, for the dead people I love, because they don't have the they don't have the chance to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually thinking about my grandmother a couple of days ago, and I was like thinking, I want that want her picture on my daughter's wall, <laughs> so that at least someone remembers her after I'm gone. Yes, and <laughs> and in the in the grief community, there's an expression: to be remembered is to be immortal. Yeah. And so when we have the photos, that's what I was saying before about the photos. And we have the photos I have uh, in our house here, I have uh, photos of my mother as a child and my grandmother as a child uh, hanging on the wall. And, you know, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's spiritually, that's, a, a, you know, just powerful, powerful. Yeah, I found that to be true as well. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions for the next seven minutes. We have one that ties in fairly well, actually, you know, with um, this talk of remembering our loved ones and how that goes on. And, and I mean, kind of isn't that what what men of war wanted when they they want statues erected for themselves, you know, like to be immortal is to have a statue. But all you really need is to be in the hearts of your loved ones still and remembered. Um, but uh, Alexander wrote, uh, if you could meet anyone alive or dead, who would it be? It would be Thomas de Quincey. I mean, this guy was so smart and influenced so many people. Poe admired Thomas de Quincey 
and created the mystery story. And then Edgar Allen, or uh, Arthur Conan Doyle admired Poe and created uh, Sherlock Holmes. And that's just one example of the way, in, you know, the, 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 the train, as it were, that De Quincey created. He was incredibly brilliant uh, uh, and anticipated so many things in our modern world. Um, I, I, uh, but on the other hand, he was a dope addict, you know. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's the only, you know, in the day, opium was either an exciter or a depressant. For him, it was an exciter, and he'd be up for like three days writing, and then he'd crash. Um, and um, so, you know, I don't recommend anybody write drinking and, or doing drugs, but the only writer, and I was a professor, the only writer I know of that, you know, we can talk about Coleridge and we can talk about Kerouac and what have you. The only writer I know of who did it successfully was Thomas De Quincey, and I don't recommend it, but you know, for him it worked. Yeah. And do you have any? I mean, you've given such great advice for aspiring screenwriters, but that was a that was a question that we had that kind of seemed like a nice like finale cap. And well, then, you know, Frick has another question, but any well, like final parting advice, even for network. Well, the thing about the thing about writing screenplays, of course, is that you're by and large work for hire. And I, I am a member of the Writers Guild. I'm a vested member. I've been a, since 1980. I have only one little, little credit on for a TV show called Monsters, but I've written a lot of movies. I wrote four drafts of Brotherhood of the Rose. And anybody in the business knows how this work. If you're early in the game, you're not gonna get the credit. You know, it's as it goes, goes down it's you know and and it gets so complicated but i i mean and you you and the writers guild will know what i'm talking about i have enough years writing screenplays i am vested you know, I, and that's hard to get um it's dream. and uh, so it's hard you know it, it, when when you you're work for hire by and large um and so what i'm going to say for for screenwriters you know, if you want, you know, to do something on the side and write novels, it would not hurt to study the career of William Goldman, who was not only, I think, our, Brit our most brilliant screenwriter as document. There may be other better screenwriters, but he knew how to write a reading script. And his novels are just amazing as novels and to see how he then adapted his own work is I think really instructive and one of my I have a whole shelf of Goldman both screenplays and novels um, but if you want to go over on on my side so to speak as an, as a novelist you have to remember that screenplays are visual but movies are, are but books are multi-sensual so if you carry over your habit of writing only visually you're going to have a flat book and you have to orient your scenes so you take the sense of sight for granted and triangulate them with other senses in the scene so the reader doesn't see. People say, oh, I read your novel. It's like I'm seeing a movie. No, you're feeling a movie. I take the sense of sight for granted. It's a sight, what, but there's plenty of data. I want people to feel my novels. And I talk about this in the successful novelist, if, you know, if anybody, I'm not trying to sell newspapers, but it might be helpful. Uh, for novelists, it's a different thing. Uh, now you're your own boss. Um, and I have two pieces of advice. Um, nobody ever had a career being an imitator. Nobody ever had being the second best. Um, the ones who go the distance and have the career are the ones who are unique. So my advice to novel writers is always the same. Be a first rate version of yourself and not a second rate version of another writer. And this works well for life. And the other is don't chase the market. You'll always see its backside. So true. Those so I have That's never, great. never, I, I, I think I had of all my 30 novels, I think I wrote maybe 26 of them and then sent them in. I didn't send in outlines. I didn't, you know, I just wrote the book I wanted to write. Now, this is very risky. Um, but, um, and, you know, our, we don't want our parents to have raised dummies. You know, we don't want to make stupid choices. Um, but uh, 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 when there is a certain parameter, write the book that you, that, 
that only you could write. I mean, if people read my books, I like to think that they say that's a morale book. Nobody else could have written that. Um, and that's what I encourage people to do. And, you know, at that point, luck takes over. You know, will, will, will the market, don't chase it, but will the market like what you've done or not? And the advantage today is there's eBooks. So you can write what you want. And, and uh, but unfortunately, a lot of ebook writers don't take editing. So, you know, a lot of it's not so good. Um, but if you can get the editing, um, you know, there are, The Martian was an ebook and became a very successful film. Um, there are many, many uh, uh, books that were written first as ebooks and then became movies. So, uh, excuse Shaq. me. The Shack was the same, it was self published ebook and then became a, became a film. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Is that what it is? I can't, I've never read it. So I've never seen the movie. That was movies. fan fiction. But, Wasn't that written as fan fiction for um, the vampire? Yeah, and then, but it's still sort of, you know, in the yeah. e-realm, if yeah. that's sort of what I mean. I mean, not polished at all, but, but you know, it got picked up. I mean, it, um, sure. but, you know, and, and when I started, you, you had to go through the traditional process. Um, but these days, if you have, a, you know, you say, by God, I'm going to write a thing about this guy on Mars and he's trapped there, you can write it. Uh, and, 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 you know, as it turned out, it was a wise thing to do. Uh, 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 but so much of this is, you know, I really think writers should have a day job. I mean, I'm blessed that my career has been so successful. I taught for 16 years, uh, but I'm, I've been, now I don't, you know, I don't need to have a day job. My writing is the day job, but I think for writers, often it's a good thing to have a day job because you don't write scared because you got the money coming in and you're not saying, oh, I got to make money, so I'll write this piece of junk. Uh, no, I'll write the best I can and hope that I can do something with it. And, you know, as Sterling Selefont said, you go to conferences, you know, you meet other writers and there are agents at these conferences. They're not in my, when I started, but now, and, uh, you know, there's, there are ways to get people to at least give you advice. I mean, there are many conferences where agents make themselves available all, all day long to talk to, to writers. So, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's not as bad as it used to be. But those are, you know, that's my advice. Be a first rate version of yourself and don't chase the mark. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, well it's, it's about time to wrap it up. Rick, Rick, did you have anything else? No, I just want to thank you yep. for joining us. Yeah. Did we get all the questions? <clears throat> um, yeah, I think we covered them pretty well. Some of them sort of overlapped with what you shared. So uh, I, I think we right. got them. I have to say, do we have a minute or two? Well, we have I have to here. say, okay, Rambo got his name from an apple. My wife, God bless her, in 1968, and I didn't have a name for the character. And he does not have a first name in the novel. He's only Rambo. And my wife was, I didn't have a name, and I knew it had to have the, uh, the, uh, the, the sound of force. And she, we had no money. Uh, you know, she had a quarter to go buy whatever. So she went, she came home with some apples that she bought at a roadside stand. And I'm, I remember it was a Saturday afternoon. We had one bedroom for my wife and I and our, our baby daughter and my desk to write on, which was not much of a desk. And a manual typewriter. And I kept leaving the name blank. She came in, she said, I bought some apples at this roadside stand. They're pretty good. You should eat one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm working, you know, go away. No, no, you should eat. I love it. You should eat the, the apple and all that mythic overtones. And so finally I said, all right. So I bit into the apple and I did what everybody says when they bite into an apple that tastes pretty good. You say that tastes pretty good. What's it called? And she said, it's a Rambo apple. And I said, what? How do you spell it? R-A-M-B-O. Now, the Rambo apple is very popular in central Pennsylvania and was the apple that Johnny Appleseed, whose real name was John Chapman, planted in Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania in the mid 1800s. So it's a very, it's got an American background. Now people sometimes say, oh, well, it came from an apple. The point, whenever I tell this story, the point of the story is you never know where you're going to get an idea. And we, we're all, 
the rest of the world are amateurs and we are professionals. And our job is to pay attention to everything. So if your wife says, eat an apple and you bite into it and it tastes good and you say, what's it called? And somebody says, it's a Rambo apple. Seize the opportunity. And you know that in our lives too, this happens to me and I hate it. Um, when, when, some, when you know, something will really interest me, I say, oh, that's interesting. And then I forget. Because if something interests me, I should be writing it down. I should be paying attention because it's what, it, you know, why does it interest me? And when I start asking that question, that's the road to a story. Um, so uh, it's funny to talk about Rambo and the Apple, but there's a, a profound subtext to it that, you, that we do not have the luxury of being lazy. Mm. We do not have the luxury of just letting shit go past us when instead we should be paying attention and just sucking everything we can and shoving it into our work. So uh, I think, you know, that might be kind of a fun way to end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was so fantastic. A, we have so many people thanking novel. you on the, on the chat and we just want to thank you so much for coming and taking this time to speak to veterans and giving us this, these amazing tidbits, as you said, not just for writing, but for life, like how to live an authentic, wonderful, fruit bearing life. If they don't go together, what's the point? Yeah. You know, and um, another time we're gonna talk about Iraq and the USO, but that's maybe another topic for a conversation. Yeah. But I- And thank you so much, Rick, for putting this together. Yeah, no problem. I just wanted to say, I think you should write a kid's book called Rambo and the Apple. Yeah. <laughs> Jack and the Beanstalk, Rambo and the Apple. Yeah. Retired Rambo plants, plants apple seeds and has a nursery. There you go. Wait, little Rambos, right? <laughs> Rambo, yeah. His great, great grandchild Rambos. Great. great. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, David. I look forward to it. All right. Well, God bless everybody and stay safe. Thank you. Um, you too. David you know, is on, have, you know, and be David kind to one of them. Yep. And David is on uh, Twitter if you want to follow him. And we are and be sending out a survey, so everybody, please fill that out, and then we will pass on your your thanks on to David. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. God bless you. Good night. All right. Thanks, everybody. At the beginning of World War II, a highly secret meeting occurred between deputy directors of intelligence, representing Nazi Germany, Colonel Willem Schmelzer the USSR, Colonel Vladimir Lysensikov, France, Henri Girard, and the United States, John Tex Auten. Hosting the meeting was Lord Percival Landish of Great Britain's MI6. Gentlemen, please. I give you my word as a professional that this room has no listening devices. What in hell are we doing here, Landish? I shall begin by quoting a very old saying. Intelligence is the second oldest profession without the scruples of the oldest. As intelligence professionals, we know that today's allies can become tomorrow's adversaries. This often leaves the individual operative suddenly an exposed and vulnerable target. I believe the time has come to protect ourselves and our profession from these political contingencies. How? Quite simply. I am proposing safety zones for all operatives, male and female. Places of asylum where they can go and be safe during wars and all operations between wars. Once inside these neutral, safe houses, the agent is home free. And once back outside? They are fair game. It's that simple. What if somebody kills inside one of those safe houses? They would be instantly terminated, a target for all intelligence agencies, hunted until dead. I like that. What would we call these places? Sanctuaries? Please, no. That sounds like a cathedral. A similar sanctuary was established in the Middle Ages by the monk Abelard under the sign of the rose, the symbol of silence. It was honored by his enemies in both the church and state. 
Why not call it the Abelard Sanction? Spring, but game out of season. Always tastes best. Uh, uh, at 10.35. Tonight. Why did you stalk me? It was a challenge. They said once you were in the woods, I'd never find you. You didn't. I found you. Romulus. 48 Cody Road, Denver, 9 a.m. Tuesday. Elliot? So, shalom. <laughs> shalom. Why are we meeting here? Is it a safer place? You're not Jewish. No, but you are. I'm sorry for the short notice, Saul, but I need you badly. This one's very quick and very dirty. How quick? There's a team waiting for you now. How dirty? You take out five men all at once. That's the address. Do I need to give you the cliché that this is vital to national security? Not necessary. It truly is vital that you succeed. Elliot, I don't deserve it. You know my last two assignments went sour. First, a delivery man showed up out of nowhere. On the next job, I barely got away. A lesser operative wouldn't have gotten away at all. 
I don't know, Elliot. I don't think I'm good enough anymore. Two assignments go bad back to back. That's burnout. Burnout? Oh, I've known you and Chris since you were six. I know you. You can't burn out. You're like me. Your work is your life. How can you burn out on life? You're not to blame, Saul. I read those reports. You're making allowances. Because of our relationship? Not true. I've never let that sway me. You know, sometimes failure can have a beneficial effect. It makes us try that much harder. I need the very best on this, Saul. That's why I'm asking you. Shameless. Whenever you need something special from me, you hand me a baby root. The first time Chris and I ever saw you at the orphanage, you handed us baby roots. You two were tough to crack. It took a gross of baby roots and months to reach you. The Jewish kid and the Irish kid, both orphans, bonded together like brothers against the world. I've loved and trained you and Chris for 30 years as your boss and as your surrogate father. And it paid off. You two became the best. The best. It's quite a legacy, Saul, and I'm damn proud of it. Have you heard from Chris? Yes, he's out, finally. He's uh, asked me to put him back on operative status. Frankly, I'm curious to see if an operative who spent six years in a Trappist monastery can still function. So we've uh, assigned him to Bangkok to terminate Malinov. Malinov? You sure he's ready to take on the KGB? He's like you, Saul. You won't disappoint the only father you've ever known, will you? No, sir. new with your damn roses. I'm proud to say that I've developed a unique variety, the blue rose. It took me 15 years. Might earn me a minor footnote on some obscure history of horticulture. The perfect place for you. I won't let you down, Ellie. I know you won't. You'll meet the infiltration team in Virginia. They know it's your show. Checkpoint nine, bird number four just drove in. All birds in the nest but one. 
When to go, guys? Stay alert. Will somebody please tell me when you planted the charges in the house? We've been watching all week. Two nights ago, before they beefed up security. You're kidding. We didn't even see you two. That doesn't exactly build my confidence in your surveillance team. We put the charges in the air conditioning duct. It'll be quite a blow. If I wanted everybody to know Mario, I'd have taken them in with us. They warned me you were a hard case. When we disperse, I gotta go to Cleveland. Cleveland! Anybody wanna swap cities? Not me, I drew Chicago. Cheer up, Tony. Cleveland's got a hot museum and a bitchin' symphony. My kind of town. Checkpoint 9, last bridge limo is approaching. That's the last one. Okay, Tony, disperse your surveillance team. This is Apple. All teams away. Repeat, all teams away. See ya. Tony. Cleveland Museum's on E Boulevard, a university circle. Gee, maybe I'll get an earlier flight. Okay, blow it. No, you take off. You wanna watch the fireworks? Yeah, you're a real hard case. industrialists dedicated to a new approach to the nation's energy crisis. The FBI has not ruled out the possibility that the explosion was the work of extremists. A number of theories have emerged, none of which have been substantiated. This doesn't make sense. So when do we terminate our own industrialists who are working for the president? And Elliot says never violate the rules. It gives me this assignment that breaks them all. First rule, no publicity. Elliot has me blow the place so there's bound to be television coverage. Second rule, after a hit, go far, hide deep. Elliot orders me to go to Atlantic City and play the casino. It's like hiding in a goldfish bowl. And why is Mario, who's supposed to be in Chicago, here at my hotel? Why is he pretending not to see me? City. Must be a screw up, huh? It must be.
is what I'm used. I want to clean up. It's a plumbing job. Suite 38, El Dorado Hotel. Good morning, Mr. President. The deputy directors and section chiefs are here, and the scramblers are activated. May I put you on speakers? Good morning, Mr. Forbes. Gentlemen, I'll be brief. I ask the director to set this meeting to handle a very special problem. The murder of Randolph Sage and his associates at Partigan. Aside from the tremendous political pressure I'm getting, Randolph Sage was a close personal friend. Bluntly, I want the ones who did it, and I want them now. The KGB called us immediately and denied any involvement. Well, of course they deny it. Quite frankly, I believe them, Mr. President. The Partican Foundation was simply an association of top executives looking at a new approach to our energy problems. Such an outrageous frontal attack isn't KGB. Well, who else if not the Russians? With respect, sir, the administration's consideration of possibly shifting away from Israel toward the Arabs is making a lot of waves. There are many other candidates out there besides the Russians. Damn it, that's only a possible policy consideration, nothing more. I want to know who did this atrocity, Gaddafi, Castro? We did, Mr. President. Is that you, Elliot? Yes, sir. Mr. President, we now believe that one of our men acting on his own made the Partigan hit. Naturally, it was not authorized. His code name is Romulus. Obviously, he is a traitor, or turned rogue, as we say. Romulus has messed up his past two assignments, and he disappeared just before the Partigan hit. He resurfaced two days ago in Atlantic City. By retracking, we can place him in the area of the Partigan explosion. Good Lord, one of our own agents. You know who turned him? Possibly. He has expensive tastes, and he's been gambling heavily at the casino, suggesting a recent payoff. Also, he's Jewish. And Israeli intelligence, the Mossad, helped us train him. My analysis is that the Israelis paid Romulus to turn. That makes sense, and it's smart. Turning one of our people to destroy Partigan for them. If you catch him, I presume you have a procedure for dealing with rogue agents? It's already been taken care of, Mr. President. Forbes, I want to put pressure on Israel. So give me anything you get that ties Israel to this mess. You understand? Yes, sir, I certainly do. Goodbye, sir. If we don't get Romulus, we are facing a congressional investigation. Or worse. Elliot, I know you're used to running things your way, but this directly involves the president, and I insist you clear it up. Sir, uh, gentlemen, uh, excuse me. I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid I have some bad news. Romulus has escaped the hit team. Are you saying you knew enough to dispatch a termination team before this meeting and you didn't tell me? It was an operation decision. Hardly worth bothering you about, sir. Romulus got two of them when they tried to make the hit. He even called our cleanup team to take care of the bodies. Damn it, he's got gall. And imagination. It's gonna take our best to get him, sir. Our very best. For 30 years I trained him. 30 years, Graham. Taught him everything. When Saul and Chris were only eight years old, do you know what they learned? The book code. The book code, by heaven. <laughs> we used to hide messages all around the orphanage. And tree stumps, shoe boxes, and comic books, everywhere. We still use it as a private code. And today, Saul took out a hit team that was waiting for him. And he thought he was burnt out. Remarkable. I hope you don't mind my asking, but how do you feel about doing this? In making decisions like this, Graham, it's best that a soldier not feel. Yes. Elliot. Romulus. I am so pleased and relieved to hear from you. But wait, use the color code. My damn phone is tapped from both sides. Black flag. Who do you think it was? The Lions. Their offense is unmistakable. Are you within sector? Yes. Would you like me to bring you in? Yes, I'd like that very much. I have a safe place for you to stay and rest while I'm arranging to bring you in. 
Are you up in your reading? Yes. 22, 35, 32, 76, 43, 12, 10, 26. Thank you. I knew I could count on you. That's what fathers are for, Romulus. I'm proud of you. I'm truly proud. His cover's been blown. He thinks the Mossad are after him.
escaped. Now, there's a son to be proud of. He probably knows that I set him up. Now, I have to find him. How? By thinking like him. I'll anticipate his moves, and I'll find him. What happens if you don't? That is unthinkable. Now, where would he go? That's how they penetrated the vest. My God, it's a homemade Mossad silencer. Wonderful. Israel's after me. You take these little rings. You take these little rings. Then you take these little rings and... Washers. They're called washers. Okay, they're called washers. You take one piece of plastic tubing, a dozen washers, and you've got a Mossad homemade silencer. It's damn clever, you operatives. Us operatives. We operatives. Mm. Captain, why don't we forget all this? Just go back to your apartment. I have orders to teach you about Mossad firearms. It's working. My arms are on fire. Ooh, corny. So cute. Back to work. The basic Mossad small arms. Beretta 22 caliber with low velocity, special load cartridges, and homemade silencer. Try it. There are other things I'd like to try, Captain. Commence firing, Lieutenant. Father Jenny. And Father Jenny. Your cryptonite. Remus.
Remus is cleared. Please, sit down. How may we help you? I assure you that there is nothing that goes on here that Kai doesn't know, short of a church confession. Please, feel free to speak. This isn't your first visit. No, I was here in the late 70s. I was pretty banged up. Fractured spine, ruptured spleen. Ah, yes. An adventure in Cambodia. My compliments. I'm glad to see you under better conditions. Janan, I must... Chris Kulmuni, Joseph Malinov. Have you met? Briefly. We must speak. Another time. Father, I need a dentist for some very special work. What kind of work? Someone who will extract teeth and be quiet about it. No records, no x-rays. But your own organization has excellent dentists. This is a special case. Sometimes we must go to other sources. I came to you because of your many contacts. Let's be frank. To remove teeth and leave no record can only mean you wish to keep a body from being identified. I'll inquire. But discreetly, of course. You'll want sanctuary here tonight? Yes. Then, as you know, the rules require that I tell you of our other guests. You've already met Major Mellon. We also have in sanctuary a Chinese operative called Snow Leopard. Snow Leopard. The infamous Colonel Chen. Thank you, Father. Pax Fabiscum. We must be especially careful for our guests. It still moves like the fog on little cat feet. You delight me by quoting Carl Sandberg. <sighs> Is it really you, Irishman? Yeah. Oh, yes. Old friend. <laughs> I do see a change. Perhaps the result of your monastery retreat. Mm -hmm. You knew about that. I saved your life, remember? Therefore, I'm responsible for you. Hmm. I kept track of you as a moral obligation. And when I heard that you joined the Trappist, I... I prayed to the Great Buddha that you would find inner peace. That was kind. Have you fully recovered? Completely. When you dragged me here from Cambodia, I was almost dead. When I became conscious, you were gone. I didn't get to thank you. You are a hardy stock, Irishman. Hmm. But listen, my friend. You must leave tonight. Leave? Why? Joseph Melanoff of the KGB is in sanctuary here. He's here because I failed to kill him. Too many years in the monastery. No. Everyone is after him. The KGB is allowing him to undermine this entire area with an incredible tonnage of opium. I will kill him tonight. In the safe house? You're going to violate the Abelard sanction? You're going to have every network after you. Besides, even if you kill him, the KGB will merely replace him with someone else. No. His death will cripple the drug operation for years to come. There is no other way. I'm prepared to pay the price. My friend, 
I beg you not to break the sanction. You see, I also feel responsible for you. This is worth dying for. There's a negative on Romulus from all teams so far. We did a saturation with his file photo. Planes, buses, rental cars, negative. He'll go to ground. You keep your travel people working. Elliot! You are not going to believe this. One of our agents, Kryptonim Remus, has just violated the Abelard sanction in Bangkok. Remus? How? He killed a KGB man named Malinoff, a Chinese named Chan, and the host of the sanctuary. Forty-some-odd years of no sanction violation, and one of our agents does it. I don't believe it. I checked the computer on Remus. You're his control, Elliot. First, Romulus turns renegade and destroys Partigan. And now another of your operatives violates the Abelard sanction. What an everlasting hell is going on? I don't know. Elliot, this is a real mess. Now I am under pressure from the Arabs, the Israelis, from the president. The KGB has put out a universal contract on Remus for sanction violation. All networks to terminate Remus on site, end quote. They've even asked for my personal assurance that we would cooperate. It's damn embarrassing. We'll join them, no question. Elliot, we must be the ones to deal with Remus to show good faith. I trained him, I'll find him. One-way ticket to Mexico City, via Singapore, Mr. Thornhill. Thank you. You're most welcome. We're setting up an interface network with airlines in the Orient. Anything that flies for the past 16 hours, I've got, including pelicans. And on Ed's screen are all of Remus's cover names, aliases, and fake passports that we know about. Do you have interface yet? Any of Remus's aliases that appear on her passenger manifest will automatically lock in. Any word yet from Kovshuk in Moscow? He's not there. Kovshuk flew straight to Bangkok after the violation. Yeah, so would I. Keep on it. I need to talk to Kovshuk. He can fit in all the pieces about what happened in Bangkok, if he'll tell me. Bingo! United Airlines 221 to Singapore, R. Thornhill, Remus Roger Thornhill, U.S. passport number 03275-0281. The first try. We must be doing something right. I'll alert a team to be waiting in Singapore. Yes, by all means. But uh, one moment, Graham. You'll need to make a list. A list? Oh, here's another one. Alec Mann to Havana. 
and Harry Lyme to Vienna, Austria. They keep coming. New Delhi, London. He's laying a fake paper trail. To be safe, you'll have to have teams meet all those flights. Right. Keep me informed, Elliot, please. Remus is not going to be on any one of them, is he? I wouldn't be. I think he'll do something more imaginative. You're still thinking ahead of him. So far. But I also train Saul. Why did I lose him? Shook on the line, calling from Bangkok. Please. Ilya Kovshek, at the Elliot. He will never let me speak Russian with him. His English is better than mine. Very well, Ilya. English. He asked about the Abelard mess. Perhaps we could share information that would help us find Remus. He wanted a dentist? No, I have no idea why. We want to get him as badly as you. I agree. I agree. This violation is a gross embarrassment. So keep in touch. You've got to find him before the other networks do. Well, it's definitely our kill. We aren't going to kill him, Graham. After all, Remus was the one person who can lead us to Romulus. Senor Bartholomew? El doctor verá usted ahora. Gracias.
Senor, are you sure you want to go through with this? You've had a day to think about it. Yes. Take out all my teeth. Well, no x-rays, no records, eh? What are you using as anesthetic? Atropine and hydroxyzine. Please come back, what? 99, 98, 97, 96. This isn't atropine. You... Will he be all right? Oh, yes. I just want to talk to him. I suggest you two go to a bar and think about ways to spend the money. Do uh, wait outside, please. Say my name. Elliot. Elliot, right. Who took you in when nobody wanted you. Remember the orphanage? Yes. I am as a father to you. The only father you ever had. And I love you as a son. Father. Son. Will you help me? Because you love me as a father? Oh, yes. We must find Saul, your brother. Have you heard from Saul? Saul? No. Saul is in great danger. We must find him. Will you help me? Yes. Find Saul? Yes. Good. Now, I must know, why did you want a dentist to remove all your teeth? So, my body could not be identified when. When? When I killed myself. Why? Didn't I tell you everything under the sodium amytal? Yes, but I don't understand. Why would you want to kill yourself? You completed your mission. You killed Malinoff, even though you had to violate the Abelard sanction. I didn't kill him. I couldn't. Chan did. I'm sick of everything. The discipline, all you taught me, finally failed. I can no longer shut out the faces of, of those I'd killed. I was exhausted with the shame of what I did. We're in a very high-risk profession, Chris. Great physical danger. You've just discovered the other kind, the spiritual danger. Some of it comes from being forced to do things that no sane person would consider. Part of it rubs off. Now, why do we do it? We don't make the rules, Chris. The other side does, always has. Partly because we get into the intelligence business very late. It sounds corny, but the simple truth is that we're forced to fight for a way of life in a game where we don't make the rules. It's so dirty. Yes, it is a dirty war, much dirtier than the other kind. If you're ordered to kill a man in the line of duty, you're an assassin. If we formally declare war and you kill him, you're a hero. Well, why did you leave the monastery? It was a very strict order. 
We were checked periodically by a psychiatrist for neurotic behavior. God doesn't need fanatics. They found me one day staring at a rock for hours. So I was invited to leave. The church couldn't use me. I trained all my life to serve you, so after wandering a while, I finally came back to you. And I failed. The faces came back. But uh, isn't suicide a mortal sin? To me, one way is acceptable. Starvation. It's the ultimate penance. It'd be a purification for all my sins, for all those I've killed. I was going into the jungle to starve. If my remains had been found with no teeth, they couldn't be identified. And I wouldn't bring the shame of my failure on the only two that mattered. You and Saul. How did you find me? We were with you from the time you set foot on that transport plane. Pretty good. <laughs> good? It was spectacular. After you left Bangkok, I assumed that you'd go on with your plan to find a dentist who could be bought. When you got to Panama City, surveillance did the rest. So I failed. Son, it took one hell of a man to try what you did. Would it be too sentimental to say that I'm honored to have trained you and too proud to let you destroy yourself? Elliot, I don't want to listen. Saul is in grave danger. Saul? Five days ago, I had him do a job for me. Reasons very complex and the job very dirty. Afterwards, one of his own team tried to get him. I tried to bring him in. Another team was waiting for him. He's on the run. He doesn't trust me. He thinks I betrayed him. You? Can you blame him? I was his only contact. Everywhere he went, they were waiting for him. How could they know? A mole deep in the agency. Somehow, he's managed to intercept our communications. He used everything I said to get Saul. I've known there's a mole since the 50s, but he's always managed to elude me. Now I think he might be tied with the Israelis because Saul said that the killers used Mossad hand-to-hand -hand style. Chris, I need your help to find Saul. I don't know where Saul is. Maybe you do. A message came for you at the facility in Bangkok. The egg is in the basket. Yeah, it's a distress signal from Saul. It tells me where to find him. There's a safe... No. Don't say any more. Keep it to yourself. I don't want you distrusting me. Besides, someone might be picking us up now with some remote surveillance tinker toy. Chris, even with every network looking for you, I want you to find your brother. His life depends on it. I'll find him. My plane is waiting. Where would you like it to take you? Houston.
I'm supposed to ask for a password. Rosebud. just left the bank. by Goonie Birds. Oh, that's gratitude. After what I went through to save your buns. I'm surprised you monks need a parachute. I figured you'd just flap your arms and fly. Okay, little boy, you don't have to hide now. Your big brother's here to scare the bad boys away. To your right. Six years, I can't believe it. Oh, we're having a ball, time flies. What the hell happened? Elliot tried to have me killed, twice. There's no way. So all I talked to him. As a mole in the agency, that's who tried to kill you. A mole? Is that what Elliot said? Yeah. It's not true. It's your airplane, dummy. When I went to the plant, I took out insurance, charged it to CIA, transportation to God. <laughs> we gotta move. Elliot sent me to find you. Why? To bring you in. The only way to do that is for me to bring you in alone. The mole isn't on to me. I don't think Elliot could find me, so he used you. He set you up. How? We'll know soon enough. Between assignments, I'd sneak up here to build it. It took me a couple of years. Nobody knows about it. Nobody. How do you know that? Well, because I'm still alive. For the moment, at least. 
good. Lots of smoke. You want somebody to find us? We'll see. Sally, I gotta tell you something. You're not the only one in trouble. I'm accused of violating the Abelard sanction in Bangkok. They think I killed three men there. I got all the networks after me. If they catch us together... Well, they can't kill us but once. <laughs> What's so funny? Well, hit teams are after me. You've got Abelard after you. The fair-haired boys are back together again, huh? This is gonna be the worst thing that happened to Elliot since we killed all his roses. What do you mean, we? You're the one who kept piling on all the fertilizer. You remember his face, what he found out? Yeah, he laughed. When he thought we weren't looking, he cried. Come on, we don't have time now. Time for what? I was followed. Sure do. I was careful, so I was very careful. Nobody knew I was looking for you. Elliot did. Boy, you're mule-headed. How would they follow me? There were no other planes. What about a spotter plane? Directly above you, 40,000 feet. Great view. I'm impressed. Let's go back. Let's talk. First, if any of the Abelard network spotted you, you'd be dead already. The orders to kill you on sight, not follow you. Second, nobody knows about that cabin. Third, only Elliot knew you were coming after me. No mole knew. Just you. And Elliot. So? I'm about to prove a point that I don't want to prove. I'm waiting. Any survivors, 
Great, let's get the heck out of here. After six years in a monastery, how do you feel about killing? You want to discuss philosophy now? There are eight men down there who've taken a vow to kill us. I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to die. Not till I've gotten some answers from Elliot. Can I count on you? why you failed. I warned you, they were the very best. Keep after them. You have every facility available to you. Incredible. First, we can't find them. When we do find them, we can't stop them. And they don't even know what's going on. The president called me today. I know. He wants to know where there's been no action on Partigan. He has no idea what that operation was all about. It's impossible to blame the Israelis for Partigan, with Romulus still alive to deny it. Judas Maccabeus. Elliot, what happens if someone, the president, finds out about everything? Well, with Romulus and Remus both dead, who's going to tell them? Not me, not you. But are you protected if they do find out? Oh, you mean my private files? Yes, Graham, I'm covered. And someday, if you're real good, I may let you read your file. Now, what would Romulus and Remus do next? They'd be coming after me. Okay, let's let all the dogs in on the hunt. Put this on the wire to all the networks, KGB, MI6, everyone. Subject, Abelard sanction violation, Church of the Moon, Bangkok. Violator Remus, cited by CIA in Wyoming. Remus has evaded execution, now assisted by CIA rogue agent Saul Grisman, cryptonym Romulus. CIA requests termination of both operatives on site. What have you got? Priority message from Mossad in Jerusalem. The chief said to give it to Colonel Bernstein. I'll take it. Personally. Colonel, a message for you from the code room. Thank you. Saul, you idiot. You stupid, beautiful idiot. What the hell has he done? Saul Grisman. Wasn't that the guy that you... We have to comply, Erica. We're Abelard sanctioned too. We have to go after him. Pass it on to all operatives with my endorsement. If we don't go after Saul, it'll look like we supported the killings in Bangkok. Oh. Erica, we still on for tonight. I'm sorry, Ben. I've had my quota of Washington parties this week. Sure. No problem. Grisman stir things up a bit. A little. How little? We all have orders to terminate him. They'll never catch him. He's too good. Cold is the hardest part of the monastery. We elected not to heat ourselves. Maybe that's why I like Nam. It was never cold there. You were never tempted to enter a Jewish monastic order? <laughs> there is no such thing. We don't believe in retreating from the whole world. Retreat? The monastery was as tough as doing another six years in special forces. We better keep moving. Why does Elliot want to kill you? 
Don't you think I keep asking myself? He's the only father I've gotten for some reason. The bastard wants me dead. I mean, why set me up to do the partigan hit and then have the Mossad take me out? It just doesn't make sense. They think you broke the Abelard sanction, which put a universal contract on you. And yet when Elliot had you, he wanted me so badly he let you go so you could lead him to me. Something big is going on. I mean, Elliot didn't just wake up one morning and decide to kill you. Look at us. The old man's got us freezing our butts off and eating cold beans because he's out thinking us. Okay. We can't confront him. We'll go around him for answers. That's what he'd do. What a delicious problem, Graham. <laughs> You're taking it well. Why not? I matched life and death against the two best operatives I ever saw. Teacher against the two top students. Why, it's classic Greek tragedy, Graham. I haven't felt so alive since my first assignment. That was in 43. I jumped into occupied France to work with the resistance against the Nazis. Oh, God, I was so terrified and so alive. May I ask you a personal question? Of course. Why roses? It's almost an obsession. Almost? It is an obsession. I've worked diligently to make it one. My retreat to sanity from an insane world. You know, rose growers dream of creating a new variety, something that never existed before. Roses are very appropriate to our profession, you know. The rose has been a symbol of secrecy since Greek mythology. In the Middle Ages, they used to place a rose above the table at secret council meetings, a meeting sub rosa, beneath the rose, reminding everyone that they were sworn to secrecy. Espionage has long used the rose as its emblem, a secret brotherhood that steals secrets. Am I boring you? No, sir. Uh... Because of Romulus and Remus, I've uh, beefed up the security here at your home. Oh, good. I've taken some precautions also. Would you press that buzzer, please? Yes, Elliot. This is Castor and Pollux. They are now responsible for my personal security. Keep both hands on the table, darling. Now take the forks and knives and shove them away from you, slowly. Do it, Erica. You must be crazy. Everybody in the world is after you. Yes. It's exciting, isn't it? Why the hell have you come here? Your hair. It's longer. I like it. I bet you let it grow for me because you knew it'd come back eventually. You wish. You drop out of my life and you just show up here and Why expect... Why is Mossad after me, Colonel? Why? Because Chris broke the Abelard sanction and you're helping him. The CIA put a termination contract on you too. All networks. That includes us. They were after me before that. <sighs> no way. You're still good. You can look me in the eye and lie like a lawyer. Oh, you ass. If Mossad was after you, don't you think I'd know? I run the whole East Coast operation. Where did you get this dumb idea? Because they tried to take me out after I hit Partigan. Partigan? You made the Partigan hit? But the president's blaming us for it. We can't talk here. Where? My place. It's close by. My date. He'll be back. He's been detained. Chris? He'll take out anyone who's guarding you if they move on us. Why would anyone be guarding me? I'm a cultural attaché. Is our culture so bad I need a bodyguard? What the 
How was that for? It was goodbye, in case someone is waiting in there. You'll die first. Satisfied. Okay, Solly. So why do you think it was the most sod who made the hit on you after Partigan? Because the hand-to-hand -hand technique was most sod. And they used Berettas with special velocity loads and homemade silencers. Just like you showed me in Israel. It's impossible. No Mossad agents could have gone after you without my okay. What if some of your Mossad agents were working for Elliot, as double agents? So? Then why would Elliot send them after you? Because Elliot is trying to kill me. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but there's something going on that makes me expendable, and I don't know what it is. That's why I came to you. You are as paranoid as a lab rat. Elliot has been like a father to you. Did Chris buy this? Oh, Chris, what am I saying? He's so crazy he broke the Abelard sanction. No, he didn't. Elliot used him to locate me, and then he sent a special forces assault team to kill us both. Erica, believe me, it's true. By a quarter of an inch. The bullet singed my hair. Would you have preferred I let him kill you? Let's go. I got the guy in the stairwell. It's probably clear.
You'll have to ditch this car. It's registered to the embassy. The police will be looking for it. This is my backup. Pay cash, not registered to the embassy. Well, that's a good idea, seeing as we were just hit by the Mossad. Mossad? Why were they Mossad, Saul? Two men hit teams using Mossad tactics and Uzis, Erica. So? Your own secret service uses Uzis to protect the president. If it was a Mossad hit, I'd know. Maybe they're not telling you everything, Colonel. Have I mentioned that you're paranoid? Paranoia has kept me alive. You could use some to open your starry little eyes. Why don't you open your own starry little eyes? You two have every network on Earth after you, including your own. We get hit and all you can think of is Mossad? Stick to being an operative, Saul. Your gift is not intelligence analysis. It just sounds like you two are still in love. Okay, Colonel, now what? I have a place we can work out of. It belongs to a friend of mine. Nobody at the embassy knows about him. Who is his friend? He's 75. He's a Dachau survivor. I served in Israel with his son. We we're very close. And you aren't there anymore, Sally? How do you know this car hasn't been tampered with? Because it didn't blow up like that one. Her going back to the Israeli woman was inevitable, given Saul's past association with her and the apparent Mossad attempts on his life. We anticipated that, and still we failed. God knows choosing Saul was a difficult enough decision. Frankly, I never understood why you selected Saul. Expediency. He was over the hill. He was expendable. I set him up for the Partigan hit by making sure that his past two assignments went badly. The Partigan Foundation had to be stopped, and the president had to think it was the Israelis. A rogue agent was the perfect solution. He completes the operation, then he dies. What I didn't count on was Saul's ability to escape. If I made him better than I thought. Alert all networks, except the Israelis, that Romulus and Remus, violators of the Abelard sanction, have been joined by a female Mossad operative. Request total surveillance and termination of subjects upon sight. Good heavens, if we don't get to Romulus, everything falls apart.
It was not Mossad at my apartment. Why not? Because even if they were operating without my knowledge and going after you, they would have gotten me out safely first. Even the head of Mossad would not sacrifice one of our own to serve as a foreign power. Nobody is that good a friend to us. But that fighting technique is taught by Mossad. And we are the only ones from outside to receive that training. And how do you know that? <laughs> you mean Elliot might kill you, but he would never lie to you? Don't you see? The men you've described as Mossad operatives also fit the same description as you. and the years just roll away. You think I'm that easy, Sally? for us to do on our honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I don't know. But if life gets any better, it'll probably kill me. Oh, you'd survive. And in about oh, 20 years, you'll probably be born with me. I doubt that. Will you? I've got a report in. What are you on a drill now? I'll be back as soon as I can. Oh no. Don't keep me waiting too long, huh? You know my love may not last. You know my love may not last. You know my love may not last. The October War.
poetic title. The Israeli tactical execution was superb. Did their little war interrupt your romance? It's not a fling, Elliot. I want to marry her. Impossible. Why impossible? A lot of agents are married. Not on your level. For people like us, relationships are always shattered by the possibility of betrayal. Are you saying there are no operatives on my level who are married? I'm saying there are no operatives on your level, period. Except, Chris, you two are unique. A wife would be a constant target for coercion to force you into an act of betrayal. Women are wonderful, charming companions and the best sexual release ever devised. But for us, nothing more. So, you're like a samurai sword. You've been hammered and honed for years to cut through bone and steel. You don't use it to slice bread. You don't use it to slice bread. You don't use it to slice bread. What? <clears throat> what are you thinking? Lots of things. Such as? Such as bone and steel. Bone and steel. Kelly had never wanted you to matter in my life. You said you would compromise me. And? He's probably right. Israeli Embassy. Cobrits. Yes. Blue Star. Sarah. Scrambler's activated. I have reason to believe Romulus and Remus are being set up by Elliot. Somehow he's trying to implicate us in the Partigan business. Give me a few days slack. Courier delivery? Use Route 11. Okay. Ready for Mama's shopping list? They know, and they know, we know, they know, and do you mind? So, if we spot them, we terminate, no matter where they are. Well, I would avoid doing it near a policeman. Very nasty prisons here. That one's ours. That's 18 people so far carrying something. He's too well dressed to be a courier, so he must be the courier. <laughs> Il vient d'acheter trois douzaines grammes de pronoms. Il n'est posé de contact. Thank you. 
Passports, IDs, driver's licenses, credit cards, $50,000. What's that? Computer printout. Elliot said you were the only ones he sent to Israel. They had the Mossad computer to run a little check. It's a list of all operatives Elliot sent for special Mossad training. 18 men. 18? I don't believe it. Look, all these others went to Israel after us. And they were sent in pairs, like us. Two lieutenants, two sergeants, two petty officers. Each pair is from the same hometown. Maybe there's a common denominator connecting the towns. Philadelphia, Akron, Omaha, Shea Gap. Ring any bells? Chris, look at this. Philadelphia Franklin School for Boys, Omaha Boys School, Akron Union City Boys Academy, Shade Gap Institute. Military schools? Orphanages. These guys are all orphans. Like us. Elliot would find pairs of kids in institutions, encourage them to bond as blood brothers, and then he'd play the surrogate father to all of them. We were just part of some damn program. Elliot deceived us from day one. He used us. When did you first meet him? We saw him talking to Colonel Nesbitt. They seemed to be good friends. I guess he'd been watching us for days, probably looking for two kids that already formed a bond. He began to visit us once a week, and he'd give us these damn baby roof bars. He was the only one who ever showed us any kindness. You can't imagine what it was like to have someone like him as your father when the others had nobody. We were apprenticed to two martial arts masters, Sensei Ishii and Sensei Kim. We were taught martial arts and discipline, and the Bushido code of the samurai. The vow the warrior takes to obey his shogun for life. Five times daily, we were to repeat the phrase, a samurai without, without a shogun, shogun is a wanderer. wanderer. Elliot is our shogun. We studied under them four hours a day, six days a week. Weren't you allowed to do what other boys do? What about girls? No girls. Recreation was movies at the school. Even when Elliot took us to the movies, it was war, spy movies. But no girls. In our training, girls are only for sexual release. Oh, wonderful. How did you get into the CIA? It was after we finished case officer training at Langley, we joined Elliott's Special Operations Unit. We were kept away from the mainstream operatives. I think we can assume that's also what happened with these other guys. <laughs> Elliott's own little army. Does the CIA know what he's doing? Probably only what he wants them to know. Nobody's that powerful. Erica. Elliot has been in the CIA longer than anyone else. He has people and entire systems that report only to him. Even the director leaves him pretty much alone. I don't care how powerful Elliot is. Somebody else has to know what he's doing. He can't shut down information to everyone. Elliot once said, to really find out about a man, talk to his enemies. Chris. Who hates Elliot more than anybody you know?
All clear. Look, 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 guy, 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 guy. I, I, I gotta have a drink. It's vermouth, sweet and dry mixed. That won't help. It's enough to take the edge off and still keep you sober. We need you sober, Hardy. Oh. Where'd you guys learn this torture? Cambodia? Sorry to play rough. Elliot's been ahead of us all the way. Elliot? Think I'd help Elliot? 28 years, the bastard got me fired. I defected to Beth first. Well, why is Elliot after you guys? That's what we're trying to find out. We want Elliot. To get him, we need whatever you got on him. What then? He's terminated with extreme prejudice. I'll drink to that. Boat coming. Clear. So on day one, Elliot and I were rivals. Elliot eventually became head of counterintelligence. I was section head of positive intelligence. I was a Boston Irish slum kid competing against Elliot. The Silver Spoon Orphan from Virginia. Elliot is an orphan? You didn't know? I thought that's why he took a shine to you two. Elliot's parents died when he was five years old. He was left plenty of money, and he was raised by a wealthy friend of his father's. Tex Otten, one of the founders of the Abelard Sanction. He was OSS and CIA. He brought Elliot in. It's a real family affair. So from day one, we were in competition, and I gave him one hell of a fight. I was beginning to discover some bad things about him. That's why he got me dumped. What do you mean you discovered bad things about him? Found out how he always gave himself an edge. How? He kept the best dirty files on anybody who could be a threat or of use to him. Presidents, cabinet members, heads of the agency. He had them all. Sex, drugs, tax evasion. When Elliot needed anything or he felt threatened, he simply showed them their file. Problem solved. Why were you investigating? Since the 50s, whenever anything went wrong with an operation, Elliot always yelled that there was a mole in the agency, and especially on big screw-ups like uh, the Bay of Pigs. He had everybody so busy looking for the mole that we never got any work done. It's a damn good way to paralyze operations, which is exactly what a real mole would do. Do you think Elliot is a mole? Well, he ain't kosher. Try and follow this. Tex Otten brought his stepson, Elliot, into the CIA. Lord Landish brought his son into MI6. Both fathers were founders of the Avalard Sanction. Sir Percival Landish, Elliot's British counterpart at MI6, is known to have very good liaison with the Soviets. So, Elliot could be the mole, Landish the courier. You have any proof? If I did, I'd be dead. But whatever Elliot's got going, it's somehow tied to Landish at MI6. You want a dirt on Elliot? What I just told you was enough to get me fired. Sir Percival Landish. Excuse me, do you know where we can get some decent roast beef in London? Beef's good, locks is lousy. He's ours. Welcome to London, Colonel. We've got the special equipment you ordered, also a very isolated location. Let's go. 
being followed. We better be, that's more security tape. Thank you. Diet included solids. You recently had two visitors. Where did they go? I don't know what you're talking about. Only one guard at the gate. You're not going to believe this. Sir Percival Landish is puttering with those damn roses just like Elliot. What about inside? He was talking to somebody. Could be a bodyguard. He's leaving. Headed towards the house. Shouldn't there be more guards? Maybe Elliot's ahead of us. Warren Landish. Could be a setup. This is England. They probably wouldn't have more than one guard on him at night. He's only a deputy director. Now, how would I know to come to you? Because Saul and Chris were both taught to think like their enemy. Naturally, they would contact their enemy's enemy to try to get information. All I had to do was to run down my list of enemies to decide whom to contact. That must have taken you forever. You weren't near the bottom of the list. Almost an afterthought. I'm crushed. Now say again who was supposed to have visited me. Saul and Chris. Oh. What's news with Saul and Chris? Good response, Hardy. Always answer a question with a question. Chris violated the Abelard sanction. Yeah? So naturally the first thing they do is go get a lush to help them. Smart. <laughs> I'd be a lot of help against the Russians. Sloppy, Hardy. Very sloppy. Never give information to an interrogator, no matter how irrelevant. You mentioned the Russians. You couldn't have known that the Russians claimed the Avalard violation unless Saul or Chris told you. So I'm out of practice. You want to torture me, torture me. But don't you lecture me. That's too cruel. I want to know what you told them and where they've gone. Okay, 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 okay. You, you don't need the chemicals. Let's talk. We have to use them anyway, Hardy. You know the drill. Oh, hell. What does it matter? Look. Saul and Chris came to see me. We talked. I told them things about you. I know where they are. Can we make a deal? No. But after we talk, I promise to make your death as pleasant as possible. Alcohol poisoning. What a guy. <laughs>
Good evening, Mr. Landis. I believe you have the advantage of me. Good. It's about time I have advantage over somebody. If you call your bodyguard in, he's dead. What do you want? Answers. And we're only going to ask once. We? We is me and my ghost friend over here. I'm the nice guy. There's no telling what he'll do. Put that down. That's a dwarf yellow princess, isn't it? It's very rare. What I tell you? Imbecile. That clothes took five years to create. Oh, young. Oh, what an exquisite teardrop. Mm. Oh, look at this luscious Aphrodite. Mm. Kid knows his roses, huh? He had a great teacher. Please, the teardrop. What do you want to know? Elliot. Elliot? What about him? He's a mole. You're his courier. That's absurd. My God. My God, stop. Elliot. I delivered messages, yes, several years ago, between Elliot and the KGB, but that doesn't make Elliot a mole. What was in the messages? I never read them. Elliot said later that one message contained information about a KGB spy in the CIA. Oh, good Lord, man, you could ask the KGB courier himself. He's in Paris. What's his name? What's he do? Stop wasting my time. He's Victor Kotcherby, the concert violinist. Didn't he defect from Russia a few oh, years ago? The Kotcherby defection was a sham. He's been KGB from the start. The free world bought the story, and Kotcherby has a brilliant cover. Not enough. Go on. Kotcherby passed the messages to me for Elliot. You could go to Paris and persuade him to tell you. Okay. You're coming with us. What? Going over the wall. With my arthritis, my brittle bones would break like matchsticks. I'm afraid my poor physical condition has created an impasse. Really? Elliot says an impasse is merely a pause between ideas. He's full of sayings like that. We'll just have to get creative. Two out of three. You stay with Landish, I go to Paris with Erica. Let's make it four out of seven. Oh, no way. We agreed. Loser babysits Landish. It's the tougher job. You might die of boredom. Look, Erica and I should be in Paris by noon. And Mossad contact should have located Kachabi. With any luck, we'll get him tonight. We'll find out what he knows and how that leads to Elliot. What happens after Elliot? I don't know. But I'm glad you're thinking about a future. Saul, I couldn't live with my conscience anymore and still serve Elliot. I'm sorry if I failed you. You never failed me. And as for Elliot, he may have manipulated most of our lives, but he could never come between us. Well, maybe after Elliot, the other ghosts will be gone, too. That is, if you don't mess up in Paris. I don't intend to. Food's great, and the women even better. Your friends are very helpful. The party's tonight. Well, call me afterwards, and be careful. Don't be such a nudge.
terminated. Make certain he's killed terminated. Terminate subject. Repeat. Terminate subject. Roger. Total technical section, well done. I had absolutely no confidence their home interface would work. He's mine! You're absolutely certain he's dead. I personally viewed the body. We're claiming the kill is an Avalot sanctioned termination. Your barbarian destroyed my yellow princess under a priceless teardrop. The blushing Aphrodite was the only one of its kind. Years of work, he'd have destroyed them all. The body? Flown out to sea, weighted and dropped. Elliot, you must inform the KGB that Romulus and the Israeli woman are going after Kotchubi in Paris. Yes. Yes, I'll do that. You sound strange, Elliot. I, uh, it's nothing. I'll inform you when I hear. So it's finally done. After all these years, I didn't think it would affect me like this. Do you still want Romulus dead? Yes. No matter how I personally feel, Romulus must be killed or everything is ruined. It's ironic. Saul and Chris, they were the first. And they've survived all the others, except Castor and Pollux. There's a Chinese saying, the greatest curse of the gods is to survive your own children. Smile as if you've just accepted an invitation from me. Then come with me around the corner and get in the car.
Get out! I trust you've had a good sleep, Romulus. It's 6 a.m. The drug leaves a licorice aftertaste and a remarkable headache. Coffee helps. If you don't usually drink coffee, you'll find that now is the perfect time to start. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. That's not necessary. You're Colonel Boris Horlick. Paris Section Chief KGB. Probably the best intelligence theoretician in Europe. Anyone who doesn't know who you are, Colonel, would be sent back to the mailroom. I'm flattered. False modesty. Erica. Down the hall. And recovering faster than you. Women normally do with this drug. It's something to do with estrogen. You were in a private sanatorium about two hours outside Paris. It's run by the KGB and is completely legit, as you say. It's something of an embarrassment to us since it annually returns a substantial profit of capitalistic proportion. Okay, Colonel. You've removed my shackles, offered me sustenance, and indicated my location. Not the usual routine for a KGB interrogation, is it? I'm afraid drugs have radically changed the art, Romulus. Besides, this isn't an interrogation. What is it? Well, that depends. Shall we discuss it like two professionals? After all, I could have easily killed you at any time. Croissant? Care to guess how we knew you were after Kotrubi? Ouija board. Elliot. He called me. Naturally, Elliot is a mole. Elliot a mole? <laughs> Don't we wish. Elliot is one of the few geniuses that intelligence has produced, if you'll pardon the pun. Witness the program that developed you and Remus. You know about the orphans? Oh, my dear fellow, the system is so brilliant it's been adopted by others. It's been named after him. The Elliot Paternal Matrix. What others? I thought you'd figured it all out, and that's why you kidnapped Landish. No. We're trying to get Elliot before he kills us. Landish is the key. Let's take a walk. Double Dean? Double Dean. Listen carefully. I want Elliot dead as badly as you do. But you said the KGB wanted him alive. <laughs> the KGB doesn't understand what's going on any more than the CIA. I know that there is a conspiracy within Abelard. It's taken me years to put it together. The conspiracy involves five members of the Abelard sanction led by Elliot of CIA, Landish of MI6, my own superior, Anton Kovshuk, who was Elliot's counterpart at KGB, the others are Beck of West Germany and de Gilles of France. What is this conspiracy? Those men have all shifted their allegiances to Abelard first and their country second. Why? Power and control. After World War II, the conspirators took it upon themselves to maintain the balance of power. Each would watchdog his own government. They would trade information and even sabotage their own government's operations, if necessary. And they did. Examples, your own U-2 incident. A Bay of Pigs, 
Great Britain's Suez Crisis, our invasion of Hungary, and the Berlin Wall. The US was tipped off to both of our operations days ahead of time. Those were the big ones. There were hundreds of others. I can just five conspirators to all this. With a small group of special operatives who can be pulled off their routine assignments and do whatever they are told. They answer only to their boss and ask no questions. The orphans. Trained in the Elliot Matrix since childhood to obey their fathers without question. Oh, God. Like destroying the Partigan Foundation. Yes. The Partigan plan would have upset the Middle East balance of power. So Elliot destroyed Partigan. But why kill me afterwards? I was still loyal to Elliot. You could have revealed that Elliot gave the order which could expose the conspiracy. With you dead, Israel could be blamed. You were expendable. All the orphans are. You have to be for the system to work. What do you want? I want the conspirators dead and the conspiracy destroyed. Why? Simple. These men are betraying their own countries in order to play God. So you want me to kill them, hmm? All five. And in the process protect you, right? Exactly. You are already a marked man and I mustn't be blamed. Remember, my immediate superior is one of the conspirators. No. My fight is with Elliot, period. You're wrong. Landish told Elliot you were coming to Paris after Kotchubi. Chris is dead. Landish had him shot. You're lying. You don't even know where he is. In England, near a lighthouse in Cornwall. That's impossible. No. One of Landish's special assault teams. Orphans molded in the Elliot Matrix. No. I have a man in MI6 no. near Landish. No. Landish insisted on seeing Chris's body. It was nearly cut in half by an Uzi at close range. No. 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 That bastard stole our lives. Fool Chris, I'll kill him. God, I'll kill him. <sighs> I haven't cried since I was five. That makes these tears very precious. Our agreement was 15 minutes. Your decision? You have a deal. You will kill all five. Landish first, Elliot last. As I locate the others, I'll feed the information to you. You're about to make a most spectacular escape. One of my most trusted men will be guarding the south entrance, end of the hall. He will be deliberately lax. Don't kill him. What about Erica? Obviously, she stays is my insurance. One of you escaping would be phenomenal. Both would be miraculous. The Kremlin does not believe in miracles. How do I know I can trust you? When all five conspirators are dead, she goes free. You have my word as one professional to another. The road in front leads to Paris. There's a blue Citroën parked ten kilometers south. Don't kill any of my men. So. That's all they said? Call if you hear anything more. 
That was a personal message to you, sent from Karshuk in Moscow. Apparently he's in a rage. Go on. Romulus uh, escaped. Saul escaped? How many did he kill? None. Is the woman dead? No, they're questioning her to find out where he's gone. A killing machine like Saul escapes and nobody's dead? No. That's wrong. That's all wrong. Apparently they wanted to question him first. They're lying. Someone let him go. <laughs> but why? To get me, obviously. Like Saul, somebody in the KGB found out what it's all about. Why can't that blockhead Kovshuk see it? But maybe the KGB has simply turned Saul. Impossible. Not one of the orphans has ever turned. The only deal they can offer him is freedom to get me. When you know Saul, that's simple. The woman is probably a hostage. By now, Saul has found out that Landish killed Chris. He'll come after Landish and me. The question is, which one first? Landish, to make me sweat. We'll lay a trap through Landish while we prepare the defensive ground if he comes after me. Get me Landish. We'll see how Romulus does against MI6. Fish and chips? Why the bloody hell did we have to meet face to face? Bloody hell? Where did you learn English, British war movies? Cambridge. Well, get on with it. I catch the hovercraft back to France in an hour. I have to talk about this face to face because I can't trust your damn telephones. How's Erica? Fine. I shall see her at the sanatorium tonight. Well, what do you want? The order of kills won't work. You want me to go after Landish, then beg to Gilles Kovchak and finally Elliot. I want Elliot immediately after I get Landish. Why? The odds. If something happens to me going down that order, Elliot would go free. And if you get Elliot, you'll forget about the others. I can't because you still hold Erica. And this deal is pointless if I don't get Elliot. No. You kill Landish, then the others. And Elliot comes last. Listen to last. me. Listen to me very carefully. I'm getting Elliot immediately after Landish, no matter how long it takes me to find him. If in the meantime any harm comes to Erica, I'll come after you. And before God, I'll get you. I'm very comfortable in Russia. Now this is your choice. Give me Elliot's location and trust me, or deal with me as an enemy. <laughs> You're completely mad. And you think like a Russian. Only when I'm up against one. The Abelard's secret retirement retreat in New Zealand recently welcomed a very distinguished American guest. Thank you. By the way, I'm taking Landish today. Today? You couldn't possibly be ready.
It's Graham in Washington. Find out what he wants. He can't be disturbed. Any message? Landish is dead. How? Explosion in his greenhouse. Remarkable. Landish and his roses. By heaven, that Romulus has style. We're ready. There isn't time. Kovchuk has arrived from Moscow. There's a grey sedan outside the front door. If you get to Romulus, tell him... Tell him we're even. Go prepare the girl for execution. Comrade Kovchuk, I have no idea you are coming. You let the American go. We both know why. Where did you hear such a... Denial adds further insult. Obviously, you planned for Romulus to kill me and Elliot and so on. I want to know where the American has gone. But I don't know what... Please give me a status reading from the snipers, will you? Status report? Just waiting for someone to kill, Chief. Number two, negative. Number three, negative. Number four, negative. You know, Elliot, it is possible Romulus doesn't know where you are. It's been six weeks. He knows. Excuse me, Elliot. I must speak with you. Yes, Felix. If your target gets inside the fence, he has sanctuary. Should your snipers shoot him then, they would be in sanctuary violation. And you will be immediately terminated by an Abelard security team. House rules. I understand. And thank you for your concern. Oh, and by the way, my compliments to the chef. The veal last night was superb. <laughs> Jacques. He used to teach at the Corton Bleu, Paris. Caution the men. Romulus must not get to the fence. He won't. These guys are the best. All units, talk to me. Don't lose your edge now. Romulus is very good. Number three, calling my shot, left eye, 500 bucks. You're on. This is number four, and I'm blood hungry.
Target's on the road. Romulus. Sanctuary. This is not your usual Abelard safe house. This is the Abelard retreat. It's expensive. Gold certificates. About $200,000. That'll buy six months. I won't be here that long. That brings us to the most important rule, the sanction. I know you're here to get Elliot or he you. If either of you violate the sanction by killing inside this retreat, you will be instantly terminated. Circled by state-of-the-art security. There's horseback riding, fishing, swimming, skiing, anything that you want. All safe within our retreat. Security patrols constantly. And they're hand-picked from all of the intelligence services. I'm impressed. You will be if you cross them. <laughs> The clientele is composed of refugees from intelligence operations everywhere. There is more behind-the-scenes history here than any other spot in the world. Look. See the guy with the beard over there? He's Egyptian. Big shot in Sadat's counterintelligence. Fled here when Sadat was assassinated. His chess opponent was an Israeli hitman against the PLO. There are no politics here. Whatever they want, they can get. Drugs, sex, food. There are no secrets here. Why don't we just nail him? You kill him here, you violate the sanctions. They'll hunt you down and they'll terminate me for giving the orders. My plan was to lure him here and to kill him before he got inside. Now we're both stalemated. I suggest the table in the corner. That one's fine. Something I said? What you did last night was very naughty. 
Fishing is the only love a man can count on. Remember? I taught you and Chris everything I know about it. Yeah, I remember. So, you got inside. Congratulations. Now we just uh, stare each other to death. Chris and I wanted to find you and hear why you betrayed us. He can't do that now. You can't begin to understand the agony of that kind of decision. Sacrificing someone you love to a greater cause. Tell me something. What cause is so great it justifies taking 18 orphaned kids and turning them into some kind of killer robots? So you found out? Oh, yeah. After all, I had a fanatic for a teacher. Oh, you weren't the first. I was. Tex Orton was my uh, surrogate father. Yeah, I know all about that, too. Let's just skip to this grand idea we've all been sacrificed for, the Abelard conspiracy. Conspiracy? Ridiculous. It's an attempt to prevent the incompetent politicians from destroying us all. So, have you any idea how stupid, petty, dangerous politicians can be? I don't want your political theories, Elliot. Just give me the reasons. This is cold reality, Sally. The reality of idiotic decisions by politicians that cost thousands of lives and billions of dollars. Are you telling me we were all sacrificed because you don't trust the duly elected? Yes. I've seen the superpowers undermine foreign governments in the name of national security. The real reason is a clash between big business and socialism. Very simply, this conspiracy, as you call it, holds the politicians in check so that no country has too big an edge or is too successful. I know I've done right, Saul. When you had me blow up Hartigan, you had me kill five businessmen. Those weren't soldiers, they weren't assassins. Five ordinary businessmen, for God's sake. All this Partigan mess, because you thought you could maintain the status quo in the Middle East? Then why did you set up the Partigan hit to be blamed on Israel? It would have blown over as the work of a fanatic. Israel would have been exonerated. You know how short the public memory is? So I was the fall guy either way. No. A soldier, sacrificed to a greater cause. Who the hell do you think you are, Elliot? God, with your army of killer robots? When I think of what we've done, turn your respect and your love, and all the while you were betraying us. Who gave you the right to run the world? Damn you to hell! Lower the gun! Now! I will not tolerate violation of the Abelard sanction. Each of you will be under guard until there is a decision. Any violation, kill him. Got a visitor. What is this? Another setup? Don't worry. They kill you, I kill them. You kill them, I kill you. Your life is so simple. So... Four hours. How did you get out? Orla gave me his automatic and a way to escape. He said you in here even. I'm sure they've killed him. Are you all right? Yes. I'm glad you're safe. What's happened? I can't get to Elliot in here. And now they're probably going to kick us out. Once outside, then he's mine. You're obsessed with killing Elliot, aren't you? For God's sake, leave. No. Not till it's over. Sweetheart, listen to me. 
You and I have been cheated. We've been robbed of so much. Solly, please. Let's go. Leave it. Let's have a life, just you and me, a normal life. No. Oh, Solly, do you realize you'll be killing your father? But he's not my father. Chris was the only family I ever had. My God, you're letting him win. The primary function of this retreat is to protect the clientele. Your presence here has jeopardized that protection. Therefore, your money will be refunded and you both shall leave. Elliot, because of your service over the years to this profession, you'll leave first. You'll have a day's head start that'll give you plenty of time to go far and hide deep. You leave in the morning. Romulus will remain 24 hours under guard. If you try to leave before then, you'll be shot. Good luck, gentlemen. That's a long time, 24 hours. He could be on the far side of the moon by the time you get out of here. You wouldn't be trying to goad me into doing something stupid, would you? <laughs> oh, I'd love to trash you for all the trouble you've caused. For the next 24 hours, I am personally gonna watch you every second. Just hoping. All units, all units, Romulus is trying to escape. Terminate on site. Motor pool negative. Chopper pad negative. We're starting a sweep. By the time the pursuing guards reached the fence, Romulus was out of accurate range. As he was beyond the official border of the retreat, pursuit was not continued. End of report.
Where's Elliot? Motel. Where? Up the road. A couple miles. Where's Pollux? With him. Chopper. I knew you'd won. Pollux? Shot twice. Dead center. Dead center. Never saw a shot like it. Well, you two are the only ones left. All the rest, dead. Put it in the bag. May we go inside? I have something to say to you. Now, the critique. When we left this morning, I knew that you'd have to follow us immediately or you'd never find us. That meant either stealing a car or taking the chopper. Breaking out of the compound with a car is bad odds, so you took the chopper. Pollux and Castor dropped me off here, then they cruised around so that you'd spot them. But you won. In conditioning you and Chris, I was also conditioning myself. Absurd of me not to know that until Chris died. Ultimately, the conditioning failed you both. The system was based on a child's need for parental love. In the end, it was defeated by love. And Chris, love for God, you, and love for a woman, hand in me and my love for my work. It's almost enough to make you believe in something. I apologize for tricking you, Romulus, but we had to get you inside to finish you. There's too much traffic out there. When he told me that Pollux was hit dead center, he was telling me that he was still alive. Pollux always wears his Kevlar vest when he's working. He should have made sure he was dead with a safety shot to the head. Sloppy, Romulus. You really are over the hill. I don't want to kill you, but I can't trust you. You might change your mind and come after me, and I still have my work to do. If it's any consolation, Sally, I love you. security tripled around my house. That maniac will be coming after me. He'll kill me if he gets a chance. We walked away once. I know he'll come back.
killing you is easy. But it doesn't make things even, Elliot. You took my brother from me. You corrupted everything I've done in my life and made everything I believe in worthless. And only God knows how many lives you've destroyed and manipulated with your dirty secret files. To lose them, that would be to lose everything, right? Well, it finally occurred to me where an obsessive maniac like you would hide those files. Sub Rosa. Under the roses, right? For the orphans, Elliot. For the orphans. Washington today, John C. Elliott, Senior Deputy Director of the CIA, resigned after 46 years of service. Elliott, a legend in the intelligence community, cited ill health as a reason for his sudden retirement. Flight 018, non-stop to Tel Aviv, is in the final boarding stage. All passengers should be on board. Yes, this way. Champagne or orange juice? Oh, no, thank you. Hello. I'm sorry, sir. You can't take those with you. Why not? Agricultural restrictions. I never had much luck with roses. <laughs> 